Chapter 1 Lucy Looks Into a Wardrobe Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. This story is about something that happened to them when they were sent away from London during the war because of the air raids. They were sent to the house of an old professor who lived in the heart of the country, ten miles from the nearest railway station and two miles from the nearest post office. He had no wife and he lived in a very large house with a housekeeper called Mrs. McCready and three servants. Their names were Ivy, Margaret, and Betty, but they do not come into the story much. He himself was a very old man with shaggy white hair, which grew over most of his face as well as on his head, and they liked him almost at once, but on the first evening when he came out to meet them at the front door he was so odd-looking that Lucy was a little afraid of him. And Edmund wanted to laugh and had to keep on pretending he was blowing his nose to hide it. As soon as they had said good night to the professor and gone upstairs on the first night, the boys came into the girls' room and they all talked it over. We've fallen on our feet, and no mistake, said Peter. This is going to be perfectly splendid. That old chap will let us do anything we like. I think he's an old dear, said Susan. So, come off it, said Edmund, who was tired and pretending not to be tired, which always made him bad-tempered. Don't go on talking like that. Like what, said Susan, and anyway, it's time you were in bed trying to talk like mother, said Edmund. And who are you to say when I'm to go to bed? Go to bed, yourself. Hadn't we all better go to bed, said Lucy. There's sure to be a row if we're heard talking here. No, there won't, said Peter. I tell you this is the sort of house where no one's going to mind what we do. Anyway, they won't hear us. It's about ten minutes walk from here down to that dining room and any amount of stairs and passages in between. What's that noise? said Lucy suddenly. It was a far larger house than she had ever been in before and the thought of all those long passages and rows of doors leading into empty rooms was beginning to make her feel a little creepy. It's only a bird, silly, said Edmund. It's an owl, said Peter. This is going to be a wonderful place for birds. I shall go to bed now. I say, let's go and explore tomorrow. You might find anything in a place like this. Did you see those mountains as we came along? And the woods? There might be eagles. There might be stags. There'll be hawks. Badgers, said Lucy. Snakes, said Edmund. Foxes, said Susan. But when next morning came, there was a steady rain falling so thick that when you looked out of the window you could see neither the mountains nor the woods, nor even the stream in the garden. Of course, it would be raining, said Edmund. They had just finished breakfast with the professor and were upstairs in the room he had set apart for them, along, the room with two windows looking out in one direction and two in another. Do stop grumbling, Ed, said Susan. Ten to one it'll clear up in an hour or so, and in the meantime we're pretty well off. There's a wireless and lots of books. Not for me, said Peter, I'm going to explore in the house. Everyone agreed to this and that was how the adventures began. It was the sort of house that you never seem to come to the end of, and it was full of unexpected places. The first few doors they tried led only into spare bedrooms, as everyone had expected that they would. But soon they came to a very long room full of pictures, and there they found a suit of armor, and after that was a room all hung with green, with a harp in one corner. And then came three steps down and five steps up, and then a kind of little upstairs hall and a door that led out onto a balcony, and then a whole series of rooms that led into each other and were lined with books, most of them very old books and some bigger than a Bible in a church. And shortly after that they looked into a room that was quite empty, except for one big wardrobe, the sort that has a looking glass in the door. There was nothing else in the room at all except a dead blue bottle on the windowsill. Nothing there, said Peter, and they all trooped out again, all except Lucy. She stayed behind because she thought it would be worth while trying the door of the wardrobe, even though she felt almost sure that it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily, 
and two mock balls dropped out. Looking into the inside, she saw several coats hanging up, mostly long fur coats. There was nothing Lucy liked so much as the smell and feel of fur. She immediately stepped into the wardrobe and got in among the coats and rubbed her face against them, leaving the door open, of course, because she knew that it is very foolish to shut oneself into any wardrobe. Soon she went further in and found that there was a second row of coats hanging up behind the first one. It was almost quite dark in there and she kept her arms stretched out in front of her so as not to bump her face into the back of the wardrobe. She took a step further in, then two or three steps, always expecting to feel woodwork against the tips of her fingers. But she could not feel it. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, going still further in and pushing the soft folds of the coats aside to make room for her. Then she noticed that there was something crunching under her feet. I wonder is that more mothballs, she thought, stooping down to feel it with her hands. But instead of feeling the hard, smooth wood of the floor of the wardrobe, she felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. This is very queer, she said, and went on a step or two further. Next moment she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it is just like branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at night time with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder and there, between the dark tree trunks, she could still see the open doorway of the wardrobe and even catch a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. It seemed to be still daylight there. I can always get back if anything goes wrong, thought Lucy. She began to walk forward, crunch crunch, over the snow and through the wood towards the other light. In about ten minutes, she reached it and found that it was a lamp post. As she stood looking at it, wondering why there was a lamp post in the middle of a wood and wondering what to do next, she heard a pitter patter of feet coming towards her. And soon after that a very strange person stepped out from among the trees into the light of the lamp post. He was only a little taller than Lucy herself and he carried over his head an umbrella, white with snow. From the waist upwards he was like a man, but his legs were shaped like a goat's and instead of feet he had goat's hoofs. He also had a tail, but Lucy did not notice this at first because it was neatly caught up over the arm that held the umbrella so as to keep it from trailing in the snow. He had a red woolen muffler round his neck and his skin was rather reddish too. He had a strange but pleasant little face with a short pointed beard and curly hair, and out of the hair there stood two horns, one on each side of his forehead. One of his hands, as I have said, held the umbrella, in the other arm he carried several brown paper parcels. What with the parcels and the snow it looked just as if he had been doing his Christmas shopping. He was a fawn. And when he saw Lucy, he gave such a start of surprise that he dropped all his parcels. Goodness gracious me, exclaimed the fawn. Chapter 2 What Lucy Found There Good evening, said Lucy. But the fawn was so busy picking up his parcels that at first he did not reply. When he had finished, he made her a little bow. Good evening, good evening, said the fawn. Excuse me, I don't want to be inquisitive. But should I be right in thinking that you are a daughter of Eve? My name's Lucy, said she, not quite understanding him. But you are, forgive me, you are what they call a girl, asked the fawn. Of course, I'm a girl, said Lucy. You are in fact human? Of course, I'm human, said Lucy, still a little puzzled. To be sure, to be sure, said the fawn. How stupid of me. But I've never seen a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve before. I am delighted. That is to say, and then he stopped as if he had been going to say something he had not intended but had remembered in time. Delighted, delighted, he went on. Allow me to introduce myself. 
My name is Tuminus. I am very pleased to meet you, Mr. Tuminus, said Lucy. And may I ask, oh Lucy, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tuminus, how you have come into Narnia. Narnia? What's that, said Lucy. This is the land of Narnia, said the Fawn, where we are now. All that lies between the lamp post and the great castle of Caerparavel on the eastern sea. And you, you have come from the wild woods of the west. I, I got in through the wardrobe in the spare room, said Lucy. Bob, said Mr. Tuminus in a rather melancholy voice, if only I had worked harder at geography when I was a little fawn, I should no doubt know all about those strange countries. It is too late now. But they aren't countries at all said Lucy, almost laughing. It's only just back there, at least, I'm not sure. It is summer there. Meanwhile, said Mr. Tuminus, it is winter in Narnia, and has been for ever so long, and we shall both catch cold if we stand here talking in the snow. Daughter of Eve from the far land of Sparum, where eternal summer reigns around the bright city of Wardrobe, how would it be if you came and had tea with me? Thank you very much. Mr. Tuminus, said Lucy. But I was wondering whether I ought to be getting back. It's only just round the corner, said the fawn, and there'll be a roaring fire, and toast, and sardines, and cake. Well, it's very kind of you, said Lucy. But I shan't be able to stay long. If you will take my arm, daughter of Eve, said Mr. Tuminus, I shall be able to hold the umbrella over both of us. That's the way. Now, off we go. And so Lucy found herself walking through the wood arm in arm with this strange creature as if they had known one another all their lives. They had not gone far before they came to a place where the ground became rough and there were rocks all about and little hills up and little hills down. At the bottom of one small valley Mr. Tuminus turned suddenly aside as if he were going to walk straight into an unusually large rock. But at the last moment Lucy found he was leading her into the entrance of a cave. As soon as they were inside, she found herself blinking in the light of a wood fire. Then Mr. Tumnus stooped and took a flaming piece of wood out of the fire with a neat little pair of tongs and lit a lamp. Now we shan't be long, he said, and immediately put a kettle on. Lucy thought she had never been in a nicer place. It was a little dry clean cave of reddish stone with a carpet on the floor and two little chairs and a table and a dresser and a mantelpiece over the fire and above that a picture of an old fawn with a gray beard. In one corner there was a door which Lucy thought must lead to Mr. Tumina's bedroom, and on one wall was a shelf full of books. Lucy looked at these while he was setting out the tea things. They had titles like the life and letters of Silenus or nymphs and their ways or men, monks, and gamekeepers a study in popular legend, or is man a myth? Now, daughter of Eve, said the fawn. And really it was a wonderful tea. There was a nice brown egg, lightly boiled, for each of them, and then sardines on toast, and then buttered toast, and then toast with honey, and then a sugar-topped cake. And when Lucy was tired of eating the fawn, began to talk. He had wonderful tales to tell of life in the forest. He told about the midnight dances and how the nymphs who lived in the wells and the dryads who lived in the trees came out to dance with the fawns, about long hunting parties after the milk-white stack who could give you wishes if you caught him. About feasting and treasure-seeking with the wild red dwarfs in deep mines and caverns far beneath the forest floor, and then about summer when the woods were green and old Silenus on his fat donkey would come to visit them, and sometimes back us himself. And then the streams would run with wine instead of water, and the whole forest would give itself up to jollification for weeks on end. Not that it isn't always winter now, he added gloomily. Then to cheer himself up, he took out from its case on the dresser a strange little flute that looked as if it were made of straw, and began to play. And the tune he played made Lucy want to cry and laugh and dance and go to sleep all at the same time. It must have been hours later when she shook herself and said, So oh, Mr. Tuminus, I'm so sorry to stop you, and I do love that tune. But really, I must go home. I only meant to stay for a few minutes. It's no good now, you know, said the phone, 
laying down his flute and shaking his head at her very sorrowfully. No good, said Lucy, jumping up and feeling rather frightened. What do you mean? I've got to go home at once. The others will be wondering what has happened to me. But a moment later, she asked, Mr. Tumnus. Whatever is the matter, for the Fawn's brown eyes had filled with tears, and then the tears began trickling down his cheeks, and soon they were running off the end of his nose, and at last he covered his face with his hands and began to howl. Mr. Tumnus. Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, in great distress. Don't. Don't. What is the matter? Aren't you well? Dear Mr. Tumnus, do tell me what is wrong. But the fawn continued sobbing as if his heart would break. And even when Lucy went over and put her arms round him and lent him her handkerchief, he did not stop. He merely took the handkerchief and kept on using it, wringing it out with both hands whenever it got too wet to be any more use, so that presently Lucy was standing in a damp patch. Mr. Tumnus, bawled Lucy in his ear, shaking him. Do stop. Stop it at once. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, a great big fawn like you. What on earth are you crying about? Oh, 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 sobbed Mr. Tumnus. I'm crying because I'm such a bad fawn. I don't think you're a bad fawn at all, said Lucy. I think you are a very good fawn. You are the nicest fawn I've ever met. Oh, oh, you wouldn't say that if you knew, replied Mr. Tumnus between his sobs. No, I'm a bad fawn. I don't suppose there ever was a worse fawn since the beginning of the world. But what have you done? asked Lucy. My old father, now, said Mr. Tumnus, that's his picture over the mantelpiece. He would never have done a thing like this. A thing like what? said Lucy. Like what I've done, said the fawn. Taken service under the white witch. That's what I am. I'm in the paint of the white witch. The white witch? Who is she? Why, it is she that has got all Narnia under her thumb. It's she that makes it always winter. Always winter and never Christmas, think of that. How awful, said Lucy. But what does she pay you for? That's the worst of it, said Mr. Tumnus with a deep groan. I'm a kidnapper for her, that's what I am. Look at me, daughter of Eve. Would you believe that I'm the sort of thong to meet a poor innocent child in the wood, one that had never done me any harm, and pretend to be friendly with it, and invite it home to my cave, all for the sake of lulling it asleep and then handing it over to the white witch? No, said Lucy. I'm sure you wouldn't do anything of the sort. But I have, said the fawn. Well, said Lucy rather slowly, well, that was pretty bad. But you're so sorry for it that I'm sure you will never do it again. Daughter of Eve, don't you understand, said the fawn. It isn't something I have done. I'm doing it now, this very moment. What do you mean, cried Lucy, turning very white. You are the child, said Mr. Tumnus. I had orders from the White Witch that if ever I saw a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve in the wood, I was to catch them and hand them over to her. And you are the first I ever met. And I've pretended to be your friend and asked you to tea, and all the time I've been meaning to wait till you were asleep and then go and tell her. Though, but you won't, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. You won't, will you? Indeed. Indeed you really mustn't. And if I don't, said he, beginning to cry again, she's sure to find out. And she'll have my tail cut off, and my horns sawn off, and my beard plucked out, and she'll wave her wand over my beautiful cloven hoofs and turn them into horrid solid hoofs like a wretched horse's. And if she is extra and specially angry she'll turn me into stone, and I shall be only a statue of a fawn in her horrible house, until the four thrones at Care Paravel are filled, and goodness knows when that will happen, or whether it will ever happen at all. I'm very sorry, Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. But please, let me go home. Of course, I will, said the fawn. Of course, I've got to. I see that now. I haven't known what humans were like before I met you. 
Of course, I can't give you up to the witch, not now that I know you. But we must be off at once. I'll see you back to the lamp post. I suppose you can find your own way from there back to spare room and wardrobe. I'm sure I can, said Lucy. We must go as quietly as we can, said Mr. Tumnus. The whole wood is full of her spies. Even some of the trees are on her side. They both got up and left the tea things on the table, and Mr. Tumnus once more put up his umbrella and gave Lucy his arm, and they went out into the snow. The journey back was not at all like the journey to the Fawn's cave. They stole along as quickly as they could, without speaking a word, and Mr. Tumnus kept to the darkest places. Lucy was relieved when they reached the lamp post again. Do you know your way from here? Daughter of Eve, said Tumnus. Lucy looked very hard between the trees and could just see in the distance a patch of light that looked like daylight. Yes, she said, I can see the wardrobe door. Then be off home as quick as you can, said the phone, and, can you ever forgive me for what I meant to do? Why, of course, I can, said Lucy, shaking him heartily by the hand. And I do hope you won't get into dreadful trouble on my account. Farewell, daughter of Eve, said he. Perhaps I may keep the handkerchief? Rather, said Lucy, and then ran towards the far-off patch of daylight as quickly as her legs would carry her. And presently instead of rough branches brushing past her she felt coats, and instead of crunching snow under her feet she felt wooden boards. And all at once she found herself jumping out of the wardrobe into the same empty room from which the whole adventure had started. She shut the wardrobe door tightly behind her and looked around, panting for breath. It was still raining and she could hear the voices of the others in the passage. I'm here, she shouted. I'm here. I've come back, I'm all right. Chapter 3 Edmund and the Wardrobe Lucy ran out of the empty room into the passage and found the other three. It's all right, she repeated, I've come back. What on earth are you talking about, Lucy, asked Susan. Why, said Lucy in amazement, haven't you all been wondering where I was? So you've been hiding, have you, said Peter. Poor old Lou, hiding and nobody noticed. You'll have to hide longer than that if you want people to start looking for you. But I've been away for hours and hours, said Lucy. The others all stared at one another. Batty, said Eggman tapping his head. Quite Batty. What do you mean, Lou, asked Peter. What I said, answered Lucy. It was just after breakfast when I went into the wardrobe, and I've been away for hours and hours, and had tea, and all sorts of things have happened. Don't be silly, Lucy said Susan. We've only just come out of that room a moment ago, and you were there, then. She's not being silly at all, said Peter. She's just making up a story for fun, aren't you, Loon? And why shouldn't she? No, Peter, I'm not, she said. It's, it's a magic wardrobe. There's a wood inside it, and it's snowing, and there's a fawn and a witch, and it's called Narnia. Come and see. The others did not know what to think, but Lucy was so excited that they all went back with her into the room. She rushed ahead of them, flung open the door of the wardrobe, and cried, Now, go in and see for yourselves. Why, you goose, said Susan, putting her head inside and pulling the fur coats apart. It's just an ordinary wardrobe, look. There's the back of it. Then everyone looked in and pulled the coats apart, and they all saw. Lucy herself saw a perfectly ordinary wardrobe. There was no wood and no snow, only the back of the wardrobe, with hooks on it. Peter went in and wrapped his knuckles on it to make sure that it was solid. A jolly good hoax, Lou, he said as he came out again, you have really taken us in, I must admit. We have believed you. But it wasn't a hoax at all, said Lucy, really and truly. It was all different a moment ago. Honestly, it was. I promise. Come, Lute, said Peter, that's going a bit far. You've had your joke. Hadn't you better drop it now? 
Lucy grew very red in the face and tried to say something, though she hardly knew what she was trying to say, and burst into tears. For the next few days, she was very miserable. She could have made it up with the others quite easily at any moment if she could have brought herself to say that the whole thing was only a story made up for fun. But Lucy was a very truthful girl and she knew that she was really in the right, and she could not bring herself to say this. The others who thought she was telling a lie, and a silly lie too, made her very unhappy. The two elder ones did this without meaning to do it, but Edmund could be spiteful, and on this occasion he was spiteful. He sneered and jeered at Lucy and kept on asking her if she'd found any other new countries in other cupboards all over the house. What made it worse was that these days ought to have been delightful. The weather was fine and they were out of doors from morning to night, bathing, fishing, climbing trees, birds nesting, and lying in the heather. But Lucy could not properly enjoy any of it. And so things went on until the next wet day. That day, when it came to the afternoon and there was still no sign of a break in the weather, they decided to play hide and seek. Susan was it, and as soon as the others scattered to hide, Lucy went to the room where the wardrobe was. She did not mean to hide in the wardrobe, because she knew that would only set the others talking again about the whole wretched business. But she did want to have one more look inside it, for by this time she was beginning to wonder herself whether Narnia and the fawn had not been a dream. The house was so large and complicated and full of hiding places that she thought she would have time to have one look into the wardrobe and then hide somewhere else. But as soon as she reached it she heard steps in the passage outside, and then there was nothing for it but to jump into the wardrobe and hold the door closed behind her. She did not shut it properly because she knew that it is very silly to shut oneself into a wardrobe, even if it is not a magic one. Now the steps she had heard were those of Edmund and he came into the room just in time to see Lucy vanishing into the wardrobe. He at once decided to get into it himself, not because he thought it a particularly good place to hide, but because he wanted to go on teasing her about her imaginary country. He opened the door. There were the coats hanging up as usual, and a smell of mothballs, and darkness, and silence, and no sign of Lucy. She thinks I'm Susan come to catch her, said Edmund to himself and so she's keeping very quiet in at the back. He jumped in and shut the door, forgetting what a very foolish thing this is to do. Then he began feeling about for Lucy in the dark. He had expected to find her in a few seconds and was very surprised when he did not. He decided to open the door again and let in some light. But he could not find the door either. He didn't like this at all and began groping wildly in every direction, he even shouted out. Lucy? Lou? Where are you? I know you're here. There was no answer and Edmund noticed that his own voice had a curious sound, not the sound you expect in a cupboard but a kind of open-air sound. He also noticed that he was unexpectedly cold, and then he saw a light. Thank goodness, said Edmund, the door must have swung open of its own accord. He forgot all about Lucy and went towards the light, which he thought was the open door of the wardrobe. But instead of finding himself stepping out into the spare room, he found himself stepping out from the shadow of some thick dark fir trees into an open place in the middle of a wood. There was crisp, dry snow under his feet and more snow lying on the branches of the trees. Overhead, there was a pale blue sky, the sort of sky a one sees on a fine winter day in the morning. Straight ahead of him he saw between the tree trunks the sun, just rising, very red and clear. Everything was perfectly still, as if he were the only living creature in that country. There was not even a robin or a squirrel among the trees, and the wood stretched as far as he could see in every direction. He shivered. He now remembered that he had been looking for Lucy, and also how unpleasant he had been to her about her imaginary country which now turned out not to have been imaginary at all. He thought that she must be somewhere quite close and so he shouted, Lucy. Lucy. I'm here, too, Edmund. There was no answer. She's angry about all the things I've been saying lately, thought Edmund. And though he did not like to admit that he had been wrong, he also did not much like being alone in this strange, cold, 
quiet place, so he shouted again. I say, Lou. I'm sorry, I didn't believe you. I see now, you were right all along. Do come out. Make it pax. Still there, was no answer. Just like a girl, said Edmund to himself, sulking somewhere, and won't accept an apology. He looked round him again and decided he did not much like this place, and had almost made up his mind to go home, when he heard, very far off in the wood, a sound of bells. He listened and the sound came nearer and nearer and at last there swept into sight a sledge drawn by two reindeer. The reindeer were about the size of Shetland ponies and their hair was so white that even the snow hardly looked white compared with them. Their branching horns were gilded and shone like something on fire when the sunrise caught them. Their harness was of scarlet leather and covered with bells. On the sledge, driving the reindeer, sat a fat dwarf who would have been about three feet high if he had been standing. He was dressed in polar bear's fur and on his head he wore a red hood with a long gold tassel hanging down from its point. His huge beard covered his knees and served him instead of a rug. But behind him, on a much higher seat in the middle of the sledge sat a very different person, a great lady, taller than any woman that Edmund had ever seen. She also was covered in white fur up to her throat and held a long straight golden wand in her right hand and wore a golden crown on her head. Her face was white, not merely pale, but white like snow or paper or icing sugar, except for her very red mouth. It was a beautiful face in other respects, but proud and cold and stern. The sledge was a fine sight as it came sweeping towards Edmund with the bells jingling and the dwarf cracking his whip and the snow flying up on each side of it. Stop, said the lady, and the dwarf pulled the reindeer up so sharp that they almost sat down. Then they recovered themselves and stood champing their bits and blowing. In the frosty air the breath coming out of their nostrils looked like smoke. And what, pray, are you, said the lady, looking hard at Edmund. I'm, I'm, my name's Edmund, said Edmund rather awkwardly. He did not like the way she looked at him. The lady frowned. Is that how you address a queen, she asked, looking sterner than ever. I beg your pardon, your majesty, I didn't know, said Edmund. Not know the queen of Narnia, cried she. Hot. You shall know us better hereafter. But I repeat, what are you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund, I don't know what you mean. I'm at school, at least, I was, it's the holidays now. Chapter 4 Turkish Delight But what are you, said the queen again. Are you a great overgrown dwarf that has cut off its beard? No, your majesty, said Edmund, I never had a beard, I'm a boy. A boy, said she. Do you mean you are a son of Adam? Edmund stood still, saying nothing. He was too confused by this time to understand what the question meant. I see you are an idiot, whatever else you may be, said the queen. Answer me, once and for all, or I shall lose my patience. Are you human? Yes, your majesty, said Edmund. And how, pray, did you come to enter my dominions? Please, your majesty, I came in through a wardrobe. A wardrobe? What do you mean? I, I opened a door and just found myself here, your majesty, said Edmund. Hot, said the queen, speaking more to herself than to him. A door. A door from the world of men. I have heard of such things. This may wreck all. But he is only one, and he is easily dealt with. As she spoke these words she rose from her seat and looked Edmund full in the face, her eyes flaming, at the same moment she raised her wand. Edmund felt sure that she was going to do something dreadful, but he seemed unable to move. Then, just as he gave himself up for lost, she appeared to change her mind. My poor child, she said in quite a different voice, how cold you look. Come and sit with me here on the sledge and I will put my mantle around you and we will talk. Edmund did not like this arrangement at all but he dared not disobey. He stepped onto the sledge and sat at her feet, and she put a fold of her fur mantle around him and tucked it well in. Perhaps something hot to drink, said the queen. 
should you like that? Yes, please, your majesty, said Edmund, whose teeth were chattering. The queen took from somewhere among her wrappings a very small bottle which looked as if it were made of copper. Then, holding out her arm, she let one drop fall from it onto the snow beside the sledge. Edmund saw the drop for a second in midair, shining like a diamond. But the moment it touched the snow there was a hissing sound and there stood a jeweled cup full of something that steamed. The dwarf immediately took this and handed it to Edmund with a bow and a smile, not a very nice smile. Edmund felt much better as he began to sip the hot drink. It was something he had never tasted before, very sweet and foamy and creamy, and it warmed him right down to his toes. It is dull, son of Adam, to drink without eating, said the queen presently. What would you like best to eat? Turkish delight, please, your majesty, said Edmund. The queen let another drop fall from her bottle onto the snow, and instantly there appeared a round box, tied with green silk ribbon, which, when opened, turned out to contain several pounds of the best Turkish delight. Each piece was sweet and light to the very center, and Edmund had never tasted anything more delicious. He was quite warm now, and very comfortable. While he was eating the queen kept asking him questions. At first Edmund tried to remember that it is rude to speak with one's mouth full, but soon he forgot about this and thought only of trying to shovel down as much Turkish delight as he could, and the more he ate the more he wanted to eat. And he never asked himself why the queen should be so inquisitive. She got him to tell her that he had one brother and two sisters, and that one of his sisters had already been in Narnia and had met a fawn there, and that no one except himself and his brother and his sisters knew anything about Narnia. She seemed especially interested in the fact that there were four of them, and kept on coming back to it. You are sure there are just four of you? she asked. Two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve, neither more nor less, and Edmund, with his mouth full of Turkish delight, kept on saying, Yes, I told you that before, and forgetting to call her Your Majesty but she didn't seem to mind now. At last the Turkish delight was all finished and Edmund was looking very hard at the empty box and wishing that she would ask him whether he would like some more. Probably the Queen knew quite well what he was thinking, for she knew, though Edmund did not that this was enchanted Turkish delight and that anyone who had once tasted it would want more and more of it, and would even, if they were allowed, go on eating it till they killed themselves. But she did not offer him any more. Instead, she said to him, Son of Adam, I should so much like to see your brother and your two sisters. Will you bring them to see me? I'll try, said Edmund, still looking at the empty box. Because, if you did come again, bringing them with you of course, I'd be able to give you some more Turkish delight. I can't do it now, the magic will only work once. In my own house, it would be another matter. Why can't we go to your house now, said Edmund. When he had first got onto the sledge, he had been afraid that she might drive away with him to some unknown place from which he would not be able to get back, but he had forgotten about that fear now. It is a lovely place my house, said the queen. I am sure you would like it. There are whole rooms full of Turkish delight, and what's more, I have no children of my own. I want a nice boy whom I could bring up as a prince and who would be king of Narnia when I am gone. While he was prince he would wear a gold crown and eat Turkish delight all day long, and you are much the cleverest and handsomest young man I've ever met. I think I would like to make you the prince, someday when you bring the others to visit me. Why not now, said Edmund. His face had become very red and his mouth and fingers were sticky. He did not look either clever or handsome whatever the queen might say. Though, but if I took you there now, said she, I shouldn't see your brother and your sisters. I very much want to know your charming relations. You are to be the prince and, later on, the king, that is understood but you must have courtiers and nobles. I will make your brother a duke and your sisters duchesses. There's nothing special about them, said Edmund, and, anyway, I could always bring them some other time. Ah, uh, but once you were in my house, said the queen, you might forget all about them. 
you would be enjoying yourself so much that you wouldn't want the bother of going to fetch them. No. You must go back to your own country now and come to me another day, with them, you understand. It is no good coming without them. But I don't even know the way back to my own country, pleaded Edmund. That's easy, answered the queen. Do you see that lamp? She pointed with her wand, and Edmund turned and saw the same lamp post under which Lucy had met the fawn. Straight on, beyond that, is the way to the world of men. And now look the other way, here she pointed in the opposite direction, and tell me if you can see two little hills rising above the trees. I think I can, said Edmund. Well my house is between those two hills. So next time you come you have only to find the lamp post and look for those two hills and walk through the wood till you reach my house. You had better keep the river on your right when you get to it. But remember, you must bring the others with you. I might have to be very angry with you if you came alone. I'll do my best, said Edmund. And, by the way, said the Queen, you needn't tell them about me. It would be fun to keep it a secret between us two, wouldn't it? Make it a surprise for them. Just bring them along to the two hills. A clever boy like you will easily think of some excuse for doing that, and when you come to my house you could just say let's see who lives here or something like that. I am sure that would be best. If your sister has met one of the thons, she may have heard strange stories about me, nasty stories that might make her afraid to come to me. Thons will say anything, you know, and now. Please, please, said Edmund suddenly, please couldn't I have just one piece of Turkish delight to eat on the way home? No, no, said the queen with a laugh, you must wait till next time. While she spoke, she signaled to the dwarf to drive on, but as the sledge swept away out of sight, the queen waved to Edmund calling out, next time. Next time. Don't forget. Come soon. Edmund was still staring after the sledge when he heard someone calling his own name, and looking round he saw Lucy coming towards him from another part of the wood. So, Edmund, she cried. So, you've got in too. Isn't it wonderful, and now? All right, said Edmund, I see you were right and it is a magic wardrobe after all. I'll say I'm sorry if you like. But where on earth have you been all this time? I've been looking for you everywhere. If I'd known you had got in I'd have waited for you, said Lucy who was too happy and excited to notice how snappishly Edmund spoke or how flushed and strange his face was. I've been having lunch with dear Mr. Tuminus, the fawn, and he's very well and the white witch has done nothing to him for letting me go, so he thinks she can't have found out and perhaps everything is going to be all right after all. The white witch, said Edmund, who she? She is a perfectly terrible person, said Lucy. She calls herself the Queen of Narnia, though she has no right to be a queen at all, and all the fawns and dryads and naiads and dwarfs and animals, at least all the good ones, simply hate her. And she can turn people into stone and do all kinds of horrible things. And she has made a magic so that it is always winter in Narnia, always winter, but it never gets to Christmas. And she drives about on a sledge drawn by a reindeer, with her wand in her hand and a crown on her head. Edmund was already feeling uncomfortable from having eaten too many sweets, and when he heard that the lady he had made friends with was a dangerous witch he felt even more uncomfortable. But he still wanted to taste that Turkish delight again more than he wanted anything else. Who told you all that stuff about the white witch? he asked. Mr. Tuminus, the fawn, said Lucy. You can't always believe what thons say, said Edmund, trying to sound as if he knew far more about them than Lucy. Who said so? asked Lucy. Everyone knows it, said Edmund, ask anybody you like. But it's pretty poor sport standing here in the snow. Let's go home. Yes, let's, said Lucy. Oh Edmund, I am glad you've gotten too. The others will have to believe in Narnia now that both of us have been there. What fun it will be. But Edmund secretly thought that it would not be as good fun for him as for her. He would have to admit that Lucy had been right, before all the others, 
and he felt sure the others would all be on the side of the fawns and the animals, but he was already more than half on the side of the witch. He did not know what he would say, or how he would keep his secret, once they were all talking about Narnia. By this time, they had walked a good way. Then suddenly they felt coats around them instead of branches, and next moment they were both standing outside the wardrobe in the empty room. I say, said Lucy, you do look awful, Edmund. Don't you feel well? I'm all right, said Edmund, but this was not true. He was feeling very sick. Come on then, said Lucy, let's find the others. What a lot we shall have to tell them. And what wonderful adventures we shall have now that we're all in it together. Chapter 5 Back on this side of the door Because the game of hide and seek was still going on, it took Edmund and Lucy some time to find the others. But when at last they were all together Lucy burst out. Peter. Susan. It's all true. Edmund has seen it too. There is a country you can get to through the wardrobe. Edmund and I both got in. We met one another in there, in the wood. Go on, Edmund, tell them all about it. What's all this about, Ed, said Peter. And now we come to one of the nastiest things in this story. Up to that moment Edmund had been feeling sick, and sulky, and annoyed with Lucy for being right, but he hadn't made up his mind what to do. When Peter suddenly asked him the question he decided all at once to do the meanest and most spiteful thing he could think of. He decided to let Lucy down. Tell us, Ed, said Susan. And Edmund gave a very superior look as if he were far older than Lucy and then a little snigger and said, Oh, yes, Lucy and I have been playing, pretending that all her story about a country in the wardrobe is true. Just for fun, of course. There's nothing there, really. Poor Lucy gave Edmund one look and rushed out of the room. Edmund, who was becoming a nastier person every minute, thought that he had scored a great success, and went on at once to say, there she goes again. What's the matter with her? That's the worst of young kids, they always. Look here, said Peter turning on him, savagely, shut up. You've been perfectly beastly to Lou ever since she started this nonsense about the wardrobe and now you go playing games with her about it and setting her off again. I believe you did it simply out of spite. But it's all nonsense, said Edmund, very taken aback. Of course, it's all nonsense, said Peter, that's just the point. Lou was perfectly all right when we left home. But since we've been down here she seems to be either going queer in the head or else turning into a most frightful liar. But whichever it is, what good do you think you'll do by jeering and nagging at her one day and encouraging her the next? I thought, I thought, said Edmund, but he couldn't think of anything to say. You didn't think anything at all, said Peter, it's just spite. You've always liked being beastly to anyone smaller than yourself. We've seen that at school, before now. To stop it, said Susan, it won't make things any better having a row between you two. Let's go and find Lucy. It was not surprising that when they found Lucy, a good deal later, everyone could see that she had been crying. Nothing they could say to her made any difference. She stuck to her story and said, I don't care what you think, and I don't care what you say. You can tell the professor, or you can write to mother, or you can do anything you like. I know I'd met a thong in there and, I wish I'd stayed there, and you are all beasts, beasts. It was an unpleasant evening. Lucy was miserable, and Edmund was beginning to feel that his plan wasn't working as well as he had expected. The two older ones were really beginning to think that Lucy was out of her mind. They stood in the passage talking about it in whispers long after she had gone to bed. The result was that next morning they decided that they really would go and tell the whole thing to the professor. He'll write to father if he thinks there is really something wrong with Lou, said Peter, it's getting beyond us. So they went and knocked at the study door, and the professor said, come in, and got up and found chairs for them and said he was quite at their disposal. Then he sat listening to them with the tips of his fingers pressed together and never interrupting, till they had finished the whole story. 
After that he said nothing for quite a long time. Then he cleared his throat and said the last thing either of them expected. How do you know, he asked, that your sister's story is not true? So, oh, but, began Susan, and then stopped. Anyone could see from the old man's face that he was perfectly serious. Then Susan pulled herself together and said, but Edmund said they had only been pretending. That is a point, said the professor, which certainly deserves consideration, very careful consideration. For instance, if you will excuse me for asking the question, does your experience lead you to regard your brother or your sister as the more reliable? I mean, which is the more truthful? That's just the funny thing about it, sir, said Peter. Up till now, I'd have said Lucy every time. And what do you think, my dear, said the professor, turning to Susan. Well, said Susan, in general, I'd say the same as Peter, but this couldn't be true, all this about the wood and the fawn. That is more than I know, said the professor and a charge of lying against someone whom you have always found truthful is a very serious thing, a very serious thing indeed. We were afraid it mightn't even be lying, said Susan. We thought there might be something wrong with Lucy. Madness, you mean, said the professor, quite coolly. Though, so, you can make your minds easy about that. One has only to look at her and talk to her to see that she is not mad. But then, said Susan and stopped. She had never dreamed that a grown-up would talk like the professor and didn't know what to think. Logic, said the professor half to himself. Why don't they teach logic at these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she is telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies and it is obvious that she is not mad. For the moment, then and unless any further evidence turns up, we must assume that she is telling the truth. Susan looked at him very hard and was quite sure from the expression on his face that he was not making fun of them. But how could it be true, sir, said Peter. Why do you say that, asked the professor. Well, for one thing, said Peter, if it was real why doesn't everyone find this country every time they go to the wardrobe? I mean. There was nothing there when we looked, even Lucy didn't pretend there was. What has that to do with it, said the professor. Well, sir, if things are real, they're there all the time. Are they, said the professor, and Peter did not know quite what to say. But there was no time, said Susan, Lucy had had no time to have gone anywhere, even if there was such a place. She came running after us the very moment we were out of the room. It was less than a minute, and she pretended to have been away for hours. That is the very thing that makes her story so likely to be true, said the professor. If there really is a door in this house that leads to some other world, if, I say, she had got into another world. I should not be at all surprised to find that that other world had a separate time of its own, so that however long you stayed there it would never take up any of our time. On the other hand, I don't think many girls of her age would invent that idea for themselves. If she had been pretending, she would have hidden for a reasonable time before coming out and telling her story. But do you really mean, sir, said Peter, that there could be other worlds, all over the place, just round the corner, like that? Nothing is more probable, said the professor, taking off his spectacles and beginning to polish them, while he muttered to himself. I wonder what they do teach them at these schools. But what are we to do, said Susan. She felt that the conversation was beginning to get off the point. My dear young lady, said the professor, suddenly looking up with a very sharp expression at both of them, there is one plan which no one has yet suggested and which is well worth trying. Once that, said Susan. We might all try minding our own business, said he. And that was the end of that conversation. After this things were a good deal better for Lucy. Peter saw to it that Edmund stopped jeering at her, and neither she nor anyone else felt inclined to talk about the wardrobe at all. It had become a rather alarming subject. And so for a time it looked as if all the adventures were coming to an end, but that was not to be. 
This house of the professors, which even he knew so little about, was so old and famous that people from all over England used to come and ask permission to see over it. It was the sort of house that is mentioned in guidebooks and even in histories, and well it might be, for all manner of stories were told about it, some of them even stranger than the one I am telling you now. And when parties of sightseers arrived and asked to see the house, the professor always gave them permission, and Mrs. McCready, the housekeeper, showed them round, telling them about the pictures and the armor and the rare books in the library. Mrs. McCready was not fond of children and did not like to be interrupted when she was telling visitors all the things she knew. She had said to Susan and Peter almost on the first morning, And please remember you're to keep out of the way whenever I'm taking a party over the house. Just as if any of us would want to waste half the morning trailing round with a crowd of strange grown-ups, said Edmund, and the other three thought the same. That was how the adventures began for the second time. A few mornings later Peter and Edmund were looking at the suit of armor and wondering if they could take it to bits when the two girls rushed into the room and said, Look out. Here comes the McCready and a whole gang with her. Sharp's the word, said Peter, and all four made off through the door at the far end of the room. But when they had got out into the green room and beyond it, into the library, they suddenly heard voices ahead of them and realized that Mrs. McCready must be bringing her party of sightseers up the back stairs, instead of up the front stairs as they had expected. And after that, whether it was that they lost their heads, or that Mrs. McCready was trying to catch them, or that some magic in the house had come to life and was chasing them into Narnia, they seemed to find themselves being followed everywhere, until at last Susan said, So, oh, bother those trippers. Here. Let's get into the wardrobe room till they've passed. No one will follow us in there. But the moment they were inside they heard voices in the passage, and then someone fumbling at the door, and then they saw the handle turning. Quick, said Peter, there's nowhere else, and flung open the wardrobe. All four of them bundled inside it and sat there, panting, in the dark. Peter held the door closed but did not shut it, for, of course, he remembered, as every sensible person does, that you should never never shut yourself up in a wardrobe. Chapter 6 Into the Forest I wish the McCready would hurry up and take all these people away, said Susan presently, I'm getting horribly cramped. And what a filthy smell of camphor, said Edmund. I expect the pockets of these coats are full of it, said Susan, to keep away moss. There's something sticking into my back said Peter. And isn't it cold, said Susan. Now that you mention it, it is cold, said Peter, and hang it all, it's wet too. What's the matter with this place? I'm sitting on something wet. It's getting wetter every minute. He struggled to his feet. Let's get out, said Edmund, they've gone. Oh, 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 said Susan suddenly. And everyone asked her what was the matter. I'm sitting against a tree, said Susan, and look. It's getting lighter, over there. By Jove, you're right, said Peter, and look there, and there. It's trees, all round. And this wet stuff is snow. Why, I do believe we've got into Lucy's wood, after all. And now there was no mistaking it, and all four children stood blinking in the daylight of a winter day. Behind them were coats hanging on pegs in front of them were snow-covered trees. Peter turned at once to Lucy. I apologize for not believing you, he said, I'm sorry. Will you shake hands? Of course, said Lucy, and did. And now, said Susan, what do we do next? Do, said Peter, why, go and explore the wood, of course. Ugh, said Susan, stamping her feet, it's pretty cold. What about putting on some of these coats? They're not ours, said Peter doubtfully. I am sure nobody would mind, said Susan. It isn't as if we wanted to take them out of the house, we shan't take them even out of the wardrobe. I never thought of that, soon, said Peter. Of course, now you put it that way, I see. No one could say you had bagged a coat as long as you leave it in the wardrobe where you found it. 
and I suppose this whole country is in the wardrobe. They immediately carried out Susan's very sensible plan. The coats were rather too big for them so that they came down to their heels and looked more like royal robes than coats when they had put them on. But they all felt a good deal warmer and each thought the others looked better in their new get-up and more suitable to the landscape. We can pretend we are Arctic explorers, said Lucy. This is going to be exciting enough without any pretending, said Peter, as he began leading the way forward into the forest. There were heavy darkish clouds overhead, and it looked as if there might be more snow before night. I say, began Edmund presently, oughtn't we to be bearing a bit more to the left, that is, if we are aiming for the lamp post. He had forgotten for the moment that he must pretend never to have been in the wood before. The moment the words were out of his mouth he realized that he had given himself away. Everyone stopped, everyone stared at him. Peter whistled. So you really were here, he said, that time Lou said she'd met you in here, and you made out she was telling lies. There was a dead silence. Well, of all the poisonous little beasts, said Peter, and shrugged his shoulders, and said no more. There seemed, indeed, no more to say and presently the four resumed their journey, but Edmund was saying to himself, I'll pay you all out for this, you pack of stuck-up, self-satisfied prigs. Where are we going anyway, said Susan, chiefly for the sake of changing the subject. I think Lou ought to be the leader, said Peter, goodness knows she deserves it. Where will you take us, Lou? What about going to see Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. He's the nice phone I told you about. Everyone agreed to this and off they went, walking briskly and stamping their feet. Lucy proved a good leader. At first she wondered whether she would be able to find the way, but she recognized an odd-looking tree in one place and a stump in another and brought them on to where the ground became uneven and into the little valley and at last to the very door of Mr. Tumnus' cave. But there a terrible surprise awaited them. The door had been wrenched off its hinges and broken to bits. Inside, the cave was dark and cold and had the damp feel and smell of a place that had not been lived in for several days. Snow had drifted in from the doorway and was heaped on the floor, mixed with something black, which turned out to be the charred sticks and ashes from the fire. Someone had apparently flung it about the room and then stamped it out. The crockery lay smashed on the floor and the picture of the fawn's father had been slashed into shreds with a knife. This is a pretty good washout, said Edmund, not much good coming here. What's this, said Peter, stooping down. He had just noticed a piece of paper which had been nailed through the carpet to the floor. Is there anything written on it? asked Susan. Yes, I think there is, answered Peter, but I can't read it in this light. Let's get out into the open air. They all went out in the daylight and crowded round Peter as he read out the following words. The former occupant of these premises, the Fawn Tumnus, is under arrest and awaiting his trial on a charge of high treason against Her Imperial Majesty Jodis, Queen of Narnia, Chatelaine of Care Paravel, Empress of the Lone Islands, etc. Also of comforting her said Majesty's enemies, harboring spies, and fraternizing with humans. Signed Fenris. ULF, Captain of the Secret Police. Long live the Queen. The children stared at each other. I don't know that I'm going to like this place, after all, said Susan. Who is this queen, Lou, said Peter. Do you know anything about her? She isn't a real queen at all, answered Lucy. She's a horrible witch, the white witch. Everyone, all the wood people, hate her. She has made an enchantment over the whole country so that it is always winter here and never Christmas. I, I wonder if there's any point in going on said Susan. I mean, it doesn't seem particularly safe here, and it looks as if it won't be much fun either. And it's getting colder every minute, and we've brought nothing to eat. What about just going home? Though, so, but we can't, we can't, said Lucy suddenly. Don't you see? We can't just go home, not after this. It is all on my account that the poor fawn has got into this trouble. 
he hid me from the witch and showed me the way back. That's what it means by comforting the queen's enemies and fraternizing with humans. We simply must try to rescue him. A lot we could do, said Edmund, when we haven't even got anything to eat. Shut up, you, said Peter, who was still very angry with Edmund. What do you think, Susan? I've a horrid feeling that Lou is right, said Susan. I don't want to go a step further, and I wish we'd never come. But I think we must try to do something for Mr. Whatever his name is, I mean the fawn. That's what I feel, too, said Peter. I'm worried about having no food with us. I'd vote for going back and getting something from the larder, only there doesn't seem to be any certainty of getting into this country again when once you've got out of it. I think we'll have to go on. So do I, said both the girls. If only we knew where the poor chap was imprisoned, said Peter. They were all still, wondering what to do next, when Lucy said, Look. There's a robin, with such a red breast. It's the first bird I've seen here. I say, I wonder can birds talk in Narnia? It almost looks as if it wanted to say something to us. Then she turned to the robin and said, Please, can you tell us where Tumnus the fawn has been taken to? As she said this, she took a step towards the bird. It at once hopped away but only as far as to the next tree. There it perched and looked at them very hard as if it understood all they had been saying. Almost without noticing that they had done so, the four children went a step or two nearer to it. At this the robin flew away again to the next tree and once more looked at them very hard. Do you know, said Lucy, I really believe he means us to follow him. I've an idea he does, said Susan, what do you think, Peter? Well, we might as well try it, answered Peter. The robin appeared to understand the matter thoroughly. It kept going from tree to tree, always a few yards ahead of them but always so near that they could easily follow it. In this way it led them on, slightly downhill. Wherever the robin alighted a little shower of snow would fall off the branch. Presently the clouds parted overhead and the winter sun came out and the snow all around them grew dazzlingly bright. They had been traveling in this way for about half an hour, with the two girls in front, when Edmund said to Peter, If you're not still too high and mighty to talk to me, I've something to say which you'd better listen to. What is it? asked Peter. Hush. Not so loud, said Edmund, there's no good frightening the girls. But have you realized what we're doing? What, said Peter, lowering his voice to a whisper. We're following a guide we know nothing about. How do we know which side that bird is on? Why shouldn't it be leading us into a trap? That's a nasty idea. Still, a robin, you know. They're good birds in all the stories I've ever read. I'm sure a robin wouldn't be on the wrong side. If it comes to that, which is the right side? How do we know that the fawns are in the right and the queen is in the wrong? We don't really know anything about either. The fawn saved Lucy. He said he did. But how do we know? And there's another thing too. Has anyone the least idea of the way home from here? Great Scott, said Peter, I haven't thought of that. And no chance of dinner, either, said Edmund. Chapter 7 A Day with the Beavers While the two boys were whispering behind, both the girls suddenly cried, oh, and stopped. The robin, cried Lucy, the robin. It's flown away. And so it had, right out of sight. And now what are we to do, said Edmund giving Peter a look which was as much as to say what did I tell you? S.H. Look, said Susan. What, said Peter. There's something moving among the trees, over there to the left. They all stared as hard as they could, and no one felt very comfortable. There it goes again, said Susan presently. I saw it that time too, said Peter. It's still there. It's just gone behind that big tree. What is it? asked Lucy, trying very hard not to sound nervous. Whatever it is, said Peter, it's dodging us. It's something that doesn't want to be seen. 
let's go home, said Susan. And then, though nobody said it out loud, everyone suddenly realized the same fact that Edmund had whispered to Peter at the end of the last chapter. They were lost. What's it like, said Lucy. It's, it's a kind of animal, said Susan, and then, look. Look. Quick. There it is. They all saw it this time, a whiskered furry face which had looked out at them from behind a tree. But this time it didn't immediately draw back. Instead, the animal put its paw against its mouth just as humans put their finger on their lips when they are signaling to you to be quiet. Then it disappeared again. The children all stood, holding their breaths. A moment later the stranger came out from behind the tree, glanced all round as if it were afraid someone was watching, said hush, made signs to them to join it in the thicker bit of wood where it was standing, and then once more disappeared. I know what it is, said Peter, it's a beaver. I saw the tail. It wants us to go to it, said Susan, and it is warning us not to make a noise. I know, said Peter. The question is are we to go to it or not? What do you think, Loon? I think it's a nice beaver, said Lucy. Yes, but how do we know, said Edmund. Shan't we have to risk it, said Susan. I mean, it's no good just standing here and I feel I want some dinner. At this moment the beaver again popped its head out from behind the tree and beckoned earnestly to them. Come on, said Peter, let's give it a try. I'll keep close together. We ought to be a match for one beaver if it turns out to be an enemy. So the children all got close together and walked up to the tree and in behind it, and there, sure enough, they found the beaver, but it still drew back, saying to them in a hoarse throaty whisper, further in, come further in. Right in here. We're not safe in the open. Only when it had led them into a dark spot where four trees grew so close together that their boughs met and the brown earth and pine needles could be seen underfoot because no snow had been able to fall there, did it begin to talk to them. Are you the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, it said. We're some of them, said Peter. S-S-S-S-H, said the beaver, not so loud please. We're not safe, even here. Why, who are you afraid of? said Peter. There's no one here but ourselves. There are the trees, said the beaver. They are always listening. Most of them are on our side, but there are trees that would betray us to her, you know who I mean, and it nodded its head several times. If it comes to talking about sides, said Edmund, how do we know you're a friend? Not meaning to be rude, Mr. Beaver, added Peter, but you see, we're strangers. Quite right, quite right, said the beaver. Here is my token. With these words it held up to them a little white object. They all looked at it in surprise, till suddenly Lucy said, Oh, of course. It's my handkerchief, the one I gave to poor Mr. Tumnus. That's right, said the beaver. Poor fellow, he got wind of the arrest before it actually happened and handed this over to me. He said that if anything happened to him, I must meet you here and take you on to. Here the beaver's voice sank into silence and it gave one or two very mysterious nods. Then signaling to the children to stand as close around it as they possibly could, so that their faces were actually tickled by its whiskers, it added in a low whisper. They say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do, but the moment the beaver had spoken these words everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand but in the dream it feels as if it had some enormous meaning, either a terrifying one which turns the whole dream into a nightmare or else a lovely meaning too lovely to put into words which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in his inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. 
Susan felt as if some delicious smell, or some delightful strain of music, had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it is the beginning of the holidays, or the beginning of summer. And what about Mr. Tumnus? said Lucy, where is he? SSSSH, said the beaver, not here. I must bring you where we can have a real talk, and also dinner. No one except Edmund felt any difficulty about trusting the beaver now, and everyone, including Edmund, was very glad to hear the word dinner. They therefore all hurried along behind their new friend who led them at a surprisingly quick pace, and always in the thickest parts of the forest, for over an hour. Everyone was feeling very tired and very hungry when suddenly the trees began to get thinner in front of them and the ground to fall steeply downhill. A minute later they came out under the open sky and found themselves looking down on a fine sight. They were standing on the edge of a steep, narrow valley at the bottom of which ran, at least it would have been running if it hadn't been frozen, a fairly large river. Just below the dam had been built across this river, and when they saw it everyone suddenly remembered that of course beavers are always making dams and felt quite sure that Mr. Beaver had made this one. They also noticed that he now had a sort of modest expression on his face, the sort of look people have when you are visiting a garden they've made or reading a story they've written. So it was only common politeness when Susan said, What a lovely dam. And Mr. Beaver didn't say hush this time, but merely a trifle. Merely a trifle. And it isn't really finished. Above the dam, there was what ought to have been a deep pool, but was now of course a level floor of dark green ice. And below the dam, much lower down, was more ice, but instead of being smooth this was all frozen into the foamy and wavy shapes in which the water had been rushing along at the very moment when the frost came. And where the water had been trickling over and spurting through the dam there was now a glittering wall of icicles, as if the side of the dam had been covered all over with flowers and wreaths and festoons of the purest sugar. And out in the middle, and partly on the top of the dam, was a funny little house shaped rather like an enormous beehive, and from a hole in the roof smoke was going up, so that when you saw it, you at once thought of cooking and became hungrier than you were before. That was what the others chiefly noticed, but Edmund noticed something else. A little lower down the river, there was another small river, which came down another small valley, to join it. And looking up that valley, Edmund could see two small hills, and he was almost sure they were the two hills which the White Witch had pointed out to him when he parted from her at the lamp post that other day. And then between them, he thought, must be her palace, only a mile off or less. And he thought about Turkish delight and about being a king, and horrible ideas came into his head. Here we are, said Mr. Beaver, and it looks as if Mrs. Beaver is expecting us. I'll lead the way. But be careful and don't slip. The top of the dam was wide enough to walk on, though not a very nice place to walk because it was covered with ice, and though the frozen pool was level with it on one side, there was a nasty drop to the lower river on the other. Along this route Mr. Beaver led them in single file right out to the middle, where they could look a long way up the river and a long way down it. And when they had reached the middle they were at the door of the house. Here we are, Mrs. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver, I've found them. Here are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, and they all went in. The first thing Lucy noticed as she went in was a burring sound, and the first thing she saw was a kind-looking old she-beaver sitting in the corner with a thread in her mouth working busily at her sewing machine, and it was from it that the sound came. She stopped her work and got up as soon as the children came in. So you've come at last, she said, holding out both her wrinkled old paws. At last. To think that ever I should live to see this day. The potatoes are on boiling and the kettle singing, and I dare say, Mr. Beaver, you'll get us some fish. That I will, said Mr. Beaver, and he went out of the house and across the ice of the deep pool to where he had a little hole in the ice, which he kept open every day with his hatchet. They took a pail with them. Mr. Beaver sat down quietly at the edge of the hole, looked hard into it, then suddenly shot in his paw and before you could say Jack Robinson had whisked out a beautiful trout. Then he did it all over again, until they had a fine catch of fish. 
Meanwhile, the girls were helping Mrs. Beaver to fill the, the kettle and lay the table and cut the bread and put the plates in the oven to heat and draw a huge jug of beer for Mr. Beaver from a barrel which stood in one corner of the house and to put on the frying pan and get the dripping hot. Lucy thought the beavers had a very snug little home, though it was not at all like Mr. Tumnus's cave. There were no books or pictures, and instead of beds there were bunks, like on board ship, built into the wall. And there were hams and strings of onions hanging from the roof, and against the walls were gum boots and oilskins and hatchets and pairs of shears and spades and trowels and things for carrying mortar in and fishing rods and fishing nets and sacks. And the cloth on the table though, very clean, was very rough. Just as the frying pan was nicely hissing Peter, and Mr. Beaver came in with the fish, which Mr. Beaver had already opened with his knife, and cleaned out in the open air. You can think how good the new caught fish smelled while they were frying, and how the hungry children longed for them to be done, and how very much hungrier still they had become before Mrs. Beaver said, Now we're nearly ready. Susan drained the potatoes and then put them all back in the empty pot to dry on the side of the range, while Lucy was helping Mrs. Beaver to dish up the trout, so that in a very few minutes everyone was drawing up stools and preparing to enjoy themselves. There was a jug of creamy milk for the children and a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table from which everyone took as much as he wanted to go with his potatoes and all the children thought. And I agree with them that there's nothing to beat good freshwater fish if you eat it. When it has been alive half an hour ago, and has come out of the pan half a minute ago. And when they had finished the fish Mrs. Beaver brought unexpectedly out of the oven a great and gloriously sticky marmalade roll, steaming hot, and at the same time moved the kettle on to the fire, so that when they had finished the marmalade roll the tea was made and ready to be poured out. And when each person had got his cup of tea, each person shoved back his stool so as to be able to lean against the wall and gave a long sigh of contentment. And now, said Mr. Beaver pushing away his empty beer mug and pulling his cup of tea towards him, if you'll just wait till I've got my pipe lit up and going nicely, why, now we can get to business. It's snowing again, he added, cocking his eye at the window. That's all the better, because it means we shan't have any visitors. And if anyone should have been trying to follow you, why he won't find any tracks. Chapter 8 What Happened After Dinner And now, said Lucy, do please tell us what's happened to Mr. Tumnus. Ah, uh, that's bad, said Mr. Beaver shaking his head. That's a very, very bad business. There's no doubt he was taken off by the police. I got that from a bird who saw it done. But where's he been taken to? asked Lucy. Well, they were heading northwards when they were last seen, and we all know what that means. No, we don't, said Susan. But Mr. Beaver shook his head in a very gloomy fashion. I'm afraid it means they were taking him to her house, said Mr. Beaver. But what will they do to him, Mr. Beaver, gasped Lucy. Well, said Mr. Beaver, you can't exactly say for sure. But there's not many taken in there that ever comes out again. Statues. All full of statues, they say it is, in the courtyard, and up the stairs, and in the hall. People she's turned, turned into stone. But, Mr. Beaver, said Lucy, can't we, I mean we must do something to save him. It's too dreadful, and it's all on my account. I don't doubt you'd save him if you could, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver but you've no chance of getting into that house against her will and ever coming out alive. Couldn't we have some stratagem, said Peter. I mean couldn't we dress up as something, or pretend to be, oh, peddless or anything, or watch till she was gone out, or, oh, hang it all, there must be some way. This phone saved my sister at his own risk, Mr. Beaver. We can't just leave him to be, to be, to have that done to him. It's no good. Son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver, no good you're trying, of all people. But now that Aslan is on the move. So, yes. Tell us about Aslan, said several voices at once, for once again that strange feeling, like the first signs of spring, like good news, had come over them. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan, said Mr. Beaver, why don't you know? He's the king. 
He's the Lord of the whole wood, but not often here, you understand. Never in my time or my father's time. But the word has reached us that he has come back. He is in Narnia at this moment. He'll settle the White Queen, all right. It is he, not you, that will save Mr. Tumnus. She won't turn him into stone too, said Edmund. Lord love you, son of Adam, what a simple thing to say, answered Mr. Beaver with a great laugh. Turn him into stone? If she can stand on her two feet and look him in the face it'll be the most she can do and more than I expect of her. No, no. He'll put all to rights, as it says in an old rhyme in these parts. Wrong will be right, when Aslan comes in sight, at the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more, when he bears his teeth, winter meets its death, and when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You'll understand, when you see him. But shall we see him? asked Susan. Why, daughter of Eve, that's what I brought you here for. I'm to lead you where you shall meet him said Mr. Beaver. Is, is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Who, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he, quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver, if there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then, he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Course, he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I'm longing to see him, said Peter, even if I do feel frightened when it comes to the point. That's right, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver bringing his paw down on the table with a crash that made all the cups and saucers rattle. And so you shall. Word has been sent that you are to meet him, tomorrow if you can, at the stone table. Where's that, said Lucy. I'll show you, said Mr. Beaver. It's down the river, a good step from here. I'll take you to it. But meanwhile, what about poor Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy. The quickest way you can help him is by going to meet Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. Once he's with us, then we can begin doing things. Not that we don't need you to. For that's another of the old rhymes. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Paravel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. So things must be drawing near their end now he's come and you've come. We've heard of Aslan coming into these parts before, long ago, nobody can say when. But there's never been any of your race here before. That's what I don't understand, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. I mean isn't the witch herself human? She'd like us to believe it, said Mr. Beaver, and it's on that that she bases her claim to be a queen. But she's no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father Adam's, your father Adam's first wife, her they called Lilith. And she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side. And on the other she comes of the giants. No, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. That's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. True enough, Mrs. Beaver, replied he, there may be two views about humans. But there's no two views about things that look like humans and aren't. I've known good dwarfs, said Mrs. Beaver. So VDI, now you come to speak of it, said her husband, but precious few, and they were the ones least like men. But in general, take my advice. When you meet anything that's going to be human and isn't yet, or used to be human once and isn't now, or ought to be human and isn't, you keep your eyes on it and feel for your hatchet. And that's why the witch is always on the lookout for any humans in Narnia. She's been watching for you this many a year, and if she knew there were four of you she'd be more dangerous still. What's that to do with it? asked Peter. Because of another prophecy, 
said Mr. Beaver. Found at Care Paravel. That's the castle on the seacoast down at the mouth of this river which ought to be the capital of the whole country, if all was as it should be. Down at Care Paravel there are four thrones and it's a saying in Narnia time out of mind that when two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve sit in those four thrones, then it will be the end not only of the white witch's reign but of her life, and that is why we had to be so cautious as we came along, for if she knew about you four, your lives wouldn't be worth a shake of my whiskers. All the children had been attending so hard to what Mr. Beaver was telling them that they had noticed nothing else for a long time. Then during the moment of silence that followed his last remark, Lucy suddenly said, I say, where's Edmund? There was a dreadful pause, and then everyone began asking, who saw him last? How long has he been missing? Is he outside? And then, all rushed to the door, and looked out. The snow was falling thickly and steadily, the green ice of the pool had vanished under a thick white blanket, and from where the little house stood in the center of the dam you could hardly see either bank. Out they went, plunging well over their ankles into the soft new snow, and went round the house in every direction. Edmund! Edmund! they called, till they were hoarse. But the silently falling snow seemed to muffle their voices, and there was not even an echo in answer. How perfectly dreadful, said Susan as they at last came back in despair. So, how I wish we'd never come. What on earth are we to do, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. Do, said Mr. Beaver, who was already putting on his snow boots, do. We must be off at once. We haven't a moment to spare. We'd better divide into four search parties, said Peter, and I'll go in different directions. Whoever finds him must come back here at once and search parties, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver. What for? Why, to look for Edmund, of course. There's no point in looking for him, said Mr. Beaver. What do you mean, said Susan, he can't be far away yet. And we've got to find him. What do you mean when you say there's no use looking for him? The reason there's no use looking said Mr. Beaver, is that we know already where he's gone. Everyone stared in amazement. Don't you understand, said Mr. Beaver. He's gone to her, to the White Witch. He has betrayed us all. Oh surely, oh really, said Susan, he can't have done that. Can't he, said Mr. Beaver looking very hard at the three children, and everything they wanted to say died on their lips for each felt suddenly quite certain inside that this was exactly what Edmund had done. But will he know the way, said Peter. Has he been in this country before, asked Mr. Beaver, has he ever been here alone? Yes, said Lucia almost in a whisper, I'm afraid he has. And did he tell you what he'd done or who he'd met? Well, no, he didn't, said Peter. Then mark my words, said Mr. Beaver, he has already met the White Witch and joined her side, and been told where she lives. I didn't like to mention it before but the moment I set eyes on that brother of yours I said to myself. Treacherous. He had the look of one who has been with the witch and eaten her food. You can always tell them if you've lived long in Narnia, something about their eyes. All the same, said Peter in a rather choking sort of voice. We'll still have to go and look for him. He is our brother, after all, even if he is rather a little beast, and he's only a kid. Go to the witch's house, said Mrs. Beaver. Don't you see that the only chance of saving either him or yourselves is to keep away from her? How do you mean, said Lucy. Why, all she wants is to get all four of you. Once you were all four inside, her house her job would be done and there'd be four new statues in her collection before you'd had time to speak. But she'll keep him alive as long as he's the only one she's got, because she'll want to use him as a decoy, as bait to catch the rest of you with. So, can no one help us, wailed Lucy. Only Aslan, said Mr. Beaver, we must go on and meet him. That's our only chance now. It seems to me, my dears, said Mrs. Beaver, that it is very important to know just when he slipped away. How much he can tell her depends on how much he heard. For instance, had we started talking of Aslan before he left. 
If not, then we may do very well, for she won't know that Aslan has come to Narnia, or that we are meeting him, and will be quite off her guard as far as that is concerned. I don't remember his being here when we were talking about Aslan, began Peter, but Lucy interrupted him. Though yes, he was, she said miserably, don't you remember, it was he who asked whether the witch couldn't turn Aslan into stone too. So he did, by Jove, said Peter, just the sort of thing he would say, too. Worse and worse, said Mr. Beaver, and the next thing is this. Was he still here when I told you that the place for meeting Aslan was the stone table? And of course, no one knew the answer to this question. Because, if he was, continued Mr. Beaver, then she'll simply sledge down in that direction and get between us and the stone table and catch us on our way down. In fact, we shall be cut off from Aslan. But that isn't what she'll do first, said Mrs. Beaver, not if I know her. The moment that Edmund tells her that we're all here she'll set out to catch us this very night, and if he's been gone about half an hour, she'll be here in about another twenty minutes. You're right, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband, we must all get away from here. There's not a moment to lose. Chapter 9 in the Witch's House And now of course you want to know what had happened to Edmund. He had eaten his share of the dinner but he hadn't really enjoyed it because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good ordinary food half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation and hadn't enjoyed it much either, because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't, but he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver told them about Aslan and until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table. It was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door. For the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling just as it gave the others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle. And just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them that the White Witch wasn't really human at all but half a gin and half a giantess, Edmund had got outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brother and sisters to be turned into stone. He did want Turkish delight and to be a prince and to pay Peter out for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do with the others, he didn't want her to be particularly nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself, but he managed to believe, or to pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them, because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me, anyway, much nicer than they are. I expect she is the rightful queen really. Anyway, She'll be better than that awful Aslan. At least, that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside him he really knew that the White Witch was bad and cruel. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling wall around him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house. And of course, there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone, for it had been nearly three o'clock when they sat down to dinner and the winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it. So he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam to the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute and what with that and the snowflakes swirling all round him he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then too there was no road. He kept slipping into deep drifts of snow, and skidding on frozen puddles, and tripping over fallen tree trunks, and sliding down steep banks, and barking his shins against rocks, till he was wet and cold and bruised all over. The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others, if he hadn't happened to say to himself. When I'm king of Narnia the first thing I shall do will be to make some decent roads. 
and of course, that set him off thinking about being a king and all the other things he would do and this cheered him up a good deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have and how many cars and all about his private cinema and where the principal railways would run and what laws he would make against beavers and dams and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter in his place when the weather changed. First the snow stopped. Then a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally, the clouds rolled away and the moon came out. It was a full moon and, shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day, only the shadows were rather confusing. He would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out by the time he got to the other river, you remember he had seen. A smaller river flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up. But the little valley down which it came was much steeper and rockier than the one he had just left and much overgrown with bushes so that he could not have managed it at all in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through for he had to stoop to go under branches and great loads of snow came sliding off onto his back. And every time this happened he thought more and more how he hated Peter, just as if all this had been Peter's fault. But at last he came to a part where it was more level and the valley opened out. And there, on the other side of the river, quite close to him, in the middle of a little plain between two hills, he saw what must be the white witch's house. And the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers, little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. They looked like huge dunces' caps or sorcerers' caps. And they shone in the moonlight and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house. But it was too late to think of turning back now. He crossed the river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring, not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deep newly fallen snow. He walked on and on, past corner after corner of the house, and past turret after turret to find the door. He had to go right round to the far side before he found it. It was a huge arch, but the great iron gates stood wide open. Edmund crept up to the arch and looked inside into the courtyard, and there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion crouched as if it was ready to spring. And Edmund stood in the shadow of the arch, afraid to go on and afraid to go back, with his knees knocking together. He stood there so long that his teeth would have been chattering with cold, even if they had not been chattering with fear. How long this really lasted I don't know, but it seemed to Edmund to last for hours. Then at last he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still. For it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing that it couldn't have been looking at him at all. In fact it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it about four feet away. Aha, thought Edmund. When it springs at the dwarf, then will be my chance to escape. But still the lion never moved, nor did the dwarf. And now at last Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion. And as soon as he had thought of that he noticed that the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow. Of course, it must be only a statue. No living animal would have let itself get covered with snow. Then very slowly and with his heart beating as if it would burst, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now he hardly dared to touch it, but at last he put out his hand, very quickly, and did. It was cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold he suddenly got warm all over right down to his toes, and at the same time there came into his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan that they were all talking about. She's caught him already and turned him into stone. So that's the end of all their fine ideas about him. Poop. Who's afraid of Aslan? 
And he stood there gloating over the stone lion, and presently, he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a mustache on the lion's upper lip and then a pair of spectacles on its eyes. Then, he said, Yeah. Silly, old Aslan. How do you like being a stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad and noble. Staring up in the moonlight that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of jeering at it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. As he got into the middle of it he saw that there were dozens of statues all about, standing here and there rather as the pieces stand on a chessboard when it is halfway through the game. There were stone satyrs, and stone wolves, and bears, and foxes, and cowday mountains of stone. There were lovely stone shapes that looked like women, but who were really the spirits of trees. There was the great shape of a centaur, and a winged horse, and a long lithe creature that Edmund took to be a dragon. They all looked so strange standing there perfectly lifelike, and also perfectly still, in the bright cold moonlight, that it was eerie work crossing the courtyard. Right in the very middle stood a huge shape like a man, but as tall as a tree, with a fierce face and a shaggy beard and a great club in its right hand. Even though he knew that it was only a stone giant and not a live one, Edmund did not like going past it. He now saw that there was a dim light showing from a doorway on the far side of the courtyard. He went to it, there was a flight of stone steps going up to an open door. Edmund went up them. Across the threshold lay a great wolf. It's all right, it's all right, he kept saying to himself, it's only a stone wolf. It can't hurt me, and he raised his leg to step over it. Instantly the huge creature rose, with all the hair bristling along its back, opened a great, red mouth and said in a growling voice, Who's there? Who's there? Stand still, stranger, and tell me who you are. If you please, sir, said Edmund, trembling so that he could hardly speak. My name is Edmund, and I'm the son of Adam that Her Majesty met in the wood the other day, and I've come to bring her the news that my brother and sisters are now in Narnia, quite close, in the beaver's house. She, she wanted to see them. I will tell Her Majesty, said the wolf. Meanwhile, stand still on the threshold, as you value your life. Then it vanished into the house. Edmund stood and waited, his fingers aching with cold and his heart pounding in his chest, and presently the grey wolf, Fenris Wolf, the chief of the witch's secret police, came bounding back and said, Come in. Come in. Fortunate favorite of the queen, or else not so fortunate. And Edmund went in, taking great care not to tread on the wolf's paws. He found himself in a long gloomy hall with many pillars, full, as the courtyard had been, of statues. The one nearest the door was a little thon with a very sad expression on its face, and Edmund couldn't help wondering if this might be Lucy's friend. The only light came from a single lamp, and close behind this sat the white witch. I'm come, your majesty, said Edmund rushing eagerly forward. How dare you come alone? said the witch in a terrible voice. Did I not tell you to bring the others with you? Please, your majesty, said Edmund, I've done the best I can. I've brought them quite close. They're in the little house on top of the dam, just up the river, with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. A slow cruel smile came over the witch's face. Is this all your news? she asked. No, your majesty, said Edmund and proceeded to tell her all he had heard before leaving the beaver's house. What? Aslan, cried the queen, Aslan. Is this true? If I find you have lied to me. Please, I'm only repeating what they said, stammered Edmund. But the queen, who was no longer attending to him, clapped her hands. Instantly the same dwarf whom Edmund had seen with her before appeared. Make ready our sledge ordered the witch, and used the harness without bells. Chapter 10 The Spell Begins to Break Now we must go back to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver and the three other children. As soon as Mr. Beaver said there's no time to lose everyone began bundling themselves into coats, 
except Mrs. Beaver, who started picking up sacks and laying them on the table, and said, Now, Mr. Beaver, just reach down that ham. And here's a packet of tea, and there's sugar, and some matches. And if someone will get two or three loaves out of the crock over there in the corner. What are you doing, Mrs. Beaver? exclaimed Susan. Packing a load for each of us, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver very coolly. You didn't think we'd set out on a journey with nothing to eat, did you? But we haven't time, said Susan, buttoning the collar of her coat. She may be here any minute. That's what I say, chimed in Mr. Beaver. Get along with you all, said his wife. Think it over, Mr. Beaver. She can't be here for a quarter of an hour at least. But don't we want as big a start as we can possibly get, said Peter, if we're to reach the stone table before her. You've got to remember that, Mrs. Beaver, said Susan. As soon as she has looked in here and finds we're gone she'll be off at top speed. That she will, said Mrs. Beaver. But we can't get there before her whatever we do, for she'll be on a sledge and we'll be walking. Then, have we no hope, said Susan. Now don't you get fussing, there's a dear, said Mrs. Beaver, but just get half a dozen clean handkerchiefs out of that drawer. Course, we've got a hope. We can't get there before her but we can keep under cover and go by way she won't expect and perhaps we'll get through. That's true enough, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband. But it's time we were out of this. And don't you start fussing either, Mr. Beaver, said his wife. There. That's better. There's four loads and the smallest for the smallest of us. That's you, my dear, she added looking at Lucy. So, do please come on, said Lucy. Well, I'm nearly ready now, answered Mrs. Beaver, at last allowing her husband to help her into her snow boots. I suppose the sewing machine's too heavy to bring? Yes. It is, said Mr. Beaver. A great deal too heavy. And you don't think you'll be able to use it while we're on the run, I suppose? I can't abide the thought of that witch fiddling with it, said Mrs. Beaver, and breaking it or stealing it, as likely as not. So, please, 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 do hurry, said the three children. And so at last they all got outside and Mr. Beaver locked the door and they set off, all carrying their loads over their shoulders. The snow had stopped and the moon had come out when they began their journey. They went in single file, first Mr. Beaver, then Lucy, then Peter, then Susan, and Mrs. Beaver last of all. Mr. Beaver led them across the dam and onto the right bank of the river and then along a very rough sort of path among the trees right down by the river bank. The sides of the valley, shining in the moonlight, towered up far above them on either hand. Best keep down here as much as possible, he said. She'll have to keep to the top, for you couldn't bring a sledge down here. It would have been a pretty enough scene to look at it through a window from a comfortable armchair, and even as things were, Lucy enjoyed it at first. But as they went on walking and walking, and walking, and as the sack she was carrying felt heavier and heavier, she began to wonder how she was going to keep up at all. And she stopped looking at the dazzling brightness of the frozen river with all its waterfalls of ice and at the white masses of the treetops and the great glaring moon and the countless stars and could only watch the little short legs of Mr. Beaver going pad 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 through the snow in front of her as if they were never going to stop. Then the moon disappeared and the snow began to fall once more. And at last Lucy was so tired that she was almost asleep and walking at the same time when suddenly she found that Mr. Beaver had turned away from the river bank to the right and was leading them steeply uphill into the very thickest bushes. And then as she came fully awake she found that Mr. Beaver was just vanishing into a little hole in the bank which had been almost hidden under the bushes until you were quite on top of it. In fact, by the time she realized what was happening, only his short flat tail was showing. Lucy immediately stooped down and crawled in after him. Then she heard noises of scrambling and puffing and panting behind her and in a moment all five of them were inside. Wherever is this, said Peter's voice, sounding tired and pale in the darkness. It's an old hiding place for beavers in bad times, said Mr. Beaver, 
and a great secret. It's not much of a place, but we must get a few hours sleep. If you hadn't all been in such a plaguey fuss when we were starting, I'd have brought some pillows, said Mrs. Beaver. It wasn't nearly such a nice cave as Mr. Tumnus's, Lucy thought, just a hole in the ground but dry and earthy. It was very small so that when they all lay down they were all a bundle of fur and clothes together, and what with that and being warmed up by their long walk they were really rather snug. If only the floor of the cave had been a little smoother. Then Mrs. Beaver handed round in the dark a little flask out of which everyone drank something. It made one cough and splutter a little and stung the throat, but it also made you feel deliciously warm after you'd swallowed it, and everyone went straight to sleep. It seemed to Lucy only the next minute when she woke up feeling a little cold and dreadfully stiff and thinking how she would like a hot bath. Then she felt a set of long whiskers tickling her cheek and saw the cold daylight coming in through the mouth of the cave. But immediately after that she was very wide awake indeed, and so was everyone else. In fact they were all sitting up with their mouths and eyes wide open, listening to a sound which was the very sound they'd all been thinking of during their walk last night. It was a sound of jingling bells. Mr. Beaver was out of the cave like a flash the moment he heard it. Perhaps you think, as Lucy thought for a moment, that this was a very silly thing for him to do. But it was really a very sensible one. He knew he could scramble to the top of the bank among bushes and brambles without being seen, and he wanted above all things to see which way the witch's sledge went. The others all sat in the cave, waiting and wondering. They waited, nearly, five minutes. Then they heard something that frightened them very much. They heard voices. So, caught Lucy, he's been seen. She's caught him. Great was their surprise when, a little later, they heard Mr. Beaver's voice calling to them from just outside the cave. It's all right, he was shouting. Come out, Mrs. Beaver. Come out, sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. It's all right. It isn't her. This was bad grammar, of course, but that is how beavers talk when they are excited. I mean, in Narnia, in our world, they usually don't talk at all. So Mrs. Beaver and the children came bundling out of the cave, all blinking in the daylight, and with earth all over them, and looking very frowsty and unbrushed and uncombed and with the sleep in their eyes. Come on, cried Mr. Beaver, who was almost dancing with delight. Come and see. This is a nasty knock for the witch. It looks as if her power was already crumbling. What do you mean, Mr. Beaver? panted Peter as they all scrambled up the steep bank of the valley together. Didn't I tell you, answered Mr. Beaver, that she'd made it always winter and never Christmas. Didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. And then they were all at the top and did see. It was a sledge, and it was reindeer with bells on their harness. But they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer, and they were not white but brown. And on the sledge sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe with a hood that had fur inside it and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him because, though you see people of his sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it is rather different. Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly. But now that the children actually stood looking at him they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big, and so glad, and so real, that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. I've come at last, said he. She has kept me out for a long time, but I have gotten at last. Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness, which you only get if you are being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presence. There is a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs. Beaver. I will drop it in your house as I pass. If you please, sir, said Mrs. Beaver, making a curtsy. It's locked up. Locks and bolts make no difference to me, 
said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr. Beaver, when you get home you will find your dam finished and mended and all the leaks stopped and a new sluice gate fitted. Mr. Beaver was so pleased that he opened his mouth very wide and then found he couldn't say anything at all. Peter, Adam's son, said Father Christmas. Here, sir, said Peter. These are your presents, was the answer, and they are tools not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the color of silver, and across it there ramped a red lion, as bright as a ripe strawberry, at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was of gold, and it had a sheath, and a sword belt, and everything it needed, and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn, as he received these gifts for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. Susan, Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas. These are for you and he handed her about and a quiver full of arrows and a little ivory horn. You must use the bow only in great need, he said, for I do not mean you to fight in the battle. It does not easily Mississippi. And when you put this horn to your lips and blow it, then, wherever you are, I think help of some kind will come to you. Last of all he said, Lucy, Eve's daughter, and Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle of what looked like glass and a small dagger. In this bottle, he said, there is a cordial made of the juice of one of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends are hurt, a few drops of this will restore you. And the dagger is to defend yourself at great need. For you also are not to be in the battle. Why, sir, said Lucy. I think, I don't know but I think I could be brave enough. That is not the point, he said. But battles are ugly when women fight. And now, here he suddenly looked less grave, here is something for the moment for you all, and he brought out a large tray containing five cups and saucers, a bowl of lump sugar, a jug of cream, and a great big teapot, all sizzling and piping hot. Then he cried out, A Merry Christmas! Long live the true king! and cracked his whip and he and the reindeer and the sledge and all were out of sight before anyone realized that they had started. Peter had just drawn his sword out of its sheath and was showing it to Mr. Beaver when Mrs. Beaver said, Now then, now then. Don't stand talking there till the tea's got cold. Just like men. Come and help to carry the tray down and we'll have breakfast. What a mercy I thought of bringing the bread knife. So down the steep bank they went and back to the cave, and Mr. Beaver cut some of the bread and ham into sandwiches, and Mrs. Beaver poured out the tea and everyone enjoyed himself. But long before they had finished enjoying themselves Mr. Beaver said, Time to be moving on now. Chapter 11 Aslan is nearer. Edmund meanwhile had been having a most disappointing time. When the dwarf had gone to get the sledge ready he expected that the witch would start being nice to him as she had been at their last meeting. But she said nothing at all. And when at last Edmund plucked up his courage to say, Please, your majesty, could I have some Turkish delight? You, you, said, she answered, silence, fool. Then she appeared to change her mind and said, as if to herself, and yet it will not do to have the brat fainting on the way. And once more clapped her hands. Another dwarf appeared. Bring the human creature food and drink, she said. The dwarf went away and presently returned bringing an iron bowl with some water in it and an iron plate with a hunk of dry bread on it. He grinned in a repulsive manner as he set them down the floor beside Edmund and said, Turkish delight for the little prince. Hot. 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 Take it away, said Edmund sulkily. I don't want dry bread. But the witch suddenly turned on him with such a terrible expression on her face that he apologized and began to nibble at the bread, though it was so stale he could hardly get it down. You may be glad enough of it before you taste bread again, said the witch. While he was still chewing away, the first dwarf came back and announced that the sledge was ready. The white witch rose and went out, ordering Edmund to go with her. 
The snow was again falling as they came into the courtyard, but she took no notice of that and made Edmund sit beside her on the sledge. But before they drove off she called Fenris Ulf, and he came bounding like an enormous dog to the side of the sledge. Take with you the swiftest of your wolves and go at once to the house of the beavers, said the witch, and kill whatever you find there. If they are already gone, then make all speed to the stone table, but do not be seen. Wait for me, they're in hiding. I meanwhile must go many miles to the west before I find a place where I can drive across the river. You may overtake these humans before they reach the stone table. You will know what to do if you find them. I hear and obey, O oh queen, growled the wolf, and immediately he shot away into the snow and darkness, as quickly as a horse can gallop. In a few minutes, he had called another wolf and was with him down on the dam and sniffing at the beaver's house. But of course, they found it empty. It would have been a dreadful thing for the beavers and the children if the night had remained fine, for the wolves would then have been able to follow their trail, and ten to one would have overtaken them before they had got to the cave. But now that the snow had begun again the scent was cold, and even the footprints were covered up. Meanwhile the dwarf whipped up the reindeer, and the witch and Edmund drove out under the archway, and on and away into the darkness and the cold. This was a terrible journey for Edmund who had no coat. Before they had been going a quarter of an hour, all the front of him was covered with snow. He soon stopped trying to shake it off because, as quickly as he did that, a new lot gathered, and he was so tired. Soon, he was wet to the skin. And oh, how miserable he was. It didn't look now as if the witch intended to make him a king. All the things he had said to make himself believe that she was good and kind and that her side was really the right side sounded to him silly now. He would have given anything to meet the others at this moment. Even Peter. The only way to comfort himself now was to try to believe that the whole thing was a dream and that he might wake up at any moment. And as they went on, hour after hour, it did come to seem like a dream. This lasted longer than I could describe, even if I wrote pages and pages about it. But I will skip on to the time when the snow had stopped and the morning had come and they were racing along in the daylight. And still they went on and on, with no sound but the everlasting swish of the snow and the creaking of the reindeer's harness. And then at last the witch said, What have we here? Stop, and they did. How Edmund hoped she was going to say something about breakfast. But she had stopped for quite a different reason. A little way off at the foot of a tree sat a merry party, a squirrel, and his wife with their children, and two satyrs and a dwarf, and an old dog fox, all on stools round a table. Edmund couldn't quite see what they were eating, but it smelled lovely, and there seemed to be decorations of holly, and he wasn't at all sure that he didn't see something like a plum pudding. At the moment when the sledge stopped, the fox, who was obviously the oldest person present, had just risen to its feet holding a glass in its right paw as if it was going to say something. But when the whole party saw the sledge stopping and who was in it, all the gaiety went out of their faces. The father squirrel stopped eating with his fork halfway to his mouth and one of the satyrs stopped with its fork actually in its mouth and the baby squirrel squealed with terror. What is the meaning of this? asked the witch queen. Nobody answered. Speak, vermin, she said again. Or do you want my dwarf to find you a tongue with his whip? What is the meaning of all this gluttony, this waste, this self-indulgence? Where did you get all these things? Please, your majesty, said the fox, we were given them. And if I might make so bold as to drink your majesty's very good health. Who gave them to you, said the witch. FFF Father Christmas, stammered the fox. What, roared the witch springing from the sledge and taking a few strides nearer to the terrified animals. He has not been here. He cannot have been here. How dare you, but no. Say you have been lying and you shall even now be forgiven. At that moment, one of the young squirrels lost its head completely. He has, he has, he has, it squeaked, beating its little spoon on the table. Edmund saw the witch bite her lips so that a drop of blood appeared on her white cheek. Then, she raised her wand. 
Oh, don't, don't, please don't, shouted Edmund. But even while he was shouting she had waved her wand and instantly, where the merry party had been there were only statues of creatures seated round a stone table on which there were stone plates and a stone. Plump Gooding As for you, said the witch, giving Edmund a stunning blow on the face as she remounted the sledge, let that teach you to ask favor for spies and traitors. Drive on. And Edmund for the first time in this story felt sorry for someone besides himself. It seemed so pitiful to think of those little stone figures sitting there all the silent days and all the dark nights, year after year, till the moss grew on them and at last even their faces crumbled away. Now they were steadily racing on again. And soon Edmund noticed that the snow which splashed against them as they rushed through it was much wetter than it had been all last night. At the same time, he noticed that he was feeling much less cold. It was also becoming foggy. In fact, every minute it grew both foggier and warmer. And the sledge was not running nearly as well as it had been running up till now. At first he thought this was because the reindeer were tired, but soon he saw that that couldn't be the real reason. The sledge jerked and skidded and kept on jolting as if it had struck against stones. And however the dwarf with the poor reindeer the sledge went slower and slower. There also seemed to be a curious noise all round them but the noise of their driving and jolting and the dwarfs shouting at the reindeer prevented Edmund from hearing what it was, until suddenly the sledge stuck so fast that it wouldn't go on at all. When that happened there was a moment's silence. And in that silence Edmund could at last listen to the other noise properly. A strange, sweet, rustling, chattering noise, and yet not so strange, for he knew he'd heard it before if only he could remember where. Then all at once he did remember. It was the noise of running water. All round them, go out of sight, there were streams chattering, murmuring, bubbling, splashing, and even roaring. And his heart gave a great leap when he realized that the frost was over. And much nearer there was a drip 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 from the branches of all the trees. And then, as he looked at one tree he saw a great load of snow slide off it and for the first time since he had entered Narnia he saw the dark green of a fir tree. But he hadn't time to listen or watch any longer for the witch said. Don't sit, staring, fool. Get out and help. And of course, Edmund had to obey. He stepped out into the snow. But it was really only slush find out and began helping the dwarf to get the sledge out of the muddy hole it had got into. They got it out in the end, and by being very cruel to the reindeer the dwarf managed to get it on the move again, and they drove a little further. And now the snow was really melting in earnest and patches of green grass were beginning to appear in every direction. Unless you have looked at a world of snow as long as Edmund had been looking at it, you will hardly be able to imagine what a relief those green patches were after the endless white. Then the sledge stopped again. It's no good, your majesty, said the dwarf. We can't sledge, in this thought. Then, we must walk, said the witch. We shall never overtake them walking, growled the dwarf. Not with the start, they've got. Are you my counselor, or my slave, said the witch. Do as you're told. Tie the hands of the human creature behind it, and keep hold of the end of the rope and take your whip, and cut the harness of the reindeer, they'll find their own way home. The dwarf obeyed, and in a few minutes Edmund found himself being forced to walk as fast as he could with his hands tied behind him. He kept on slipping in the slush and mud and wet grass, and every time he slipped the dwarf gave him a curse and sometimes a flick with the whip. The witch walked behind the dwarf and kept on saying, Faster! Faster! Every moment the patches of green grew bigger and the patches of snow grew smaller. Every moment, more and more of the trees shook off their robes of snow. Soon, wherever you looked, instead of white shapes you saw the dark green of firs or the black prickly branches of bare oaks and beeches and elms. Then the mist turned from white to gold and presently cleared away altogether. Shafts of delicious sunlight struck down onto the forest floor and overhead, you could see a blue sky between the treetops. Soon, there were more wonderful things happening. 
Coming suddenly round a corner into a glade of silver birch trees, Edmund saw the ground covered in all directions with little yellow flowers, celandines. The noise of water grew louder. Presently, they actually crossed a stream. Beyond it they found snowdrops growing. Mind your own business, said the dwarf when he saw that Edmund had turned his head to look at them, and he gave the rope a vicious jerk. But of course, this didn't prevent Edmund from seeing. Only five minutes later he noticed a dozen crocuses growing round the foot of an old tree, gold and purple and white. Then came a sound even more delicious than the sound of the water. Close beside the path, they were following a bird suddenly chirped from the branch of a tree. It was answered by the chuckle of another bird a little further off. And then, as if that had been a signal, there was chattering and chirruping in every direction, and then a moment of full song, and within five minutes the whole wood was ringing with birds' music, and wherever Edmund's eyes turned he saw birds alighting on branches or sailing overhead, or having their little quarrels. Faster! Faster, said the witch. There was no trace of the fog now. The sky became bluer and bluer and now there were white clouds hurrying across it from time to time. In the wide glades, there were primroses. A light breeze sprang up which scattered drops of moisture from the swaying branches and carried cool, delicious scents against the faces of the travelers. The trees began to come, fully alive. The larches and birches were covered with green, the laburnums with gold. Soon the beech trees had put forth their delicate, transparent leaves. As the travelers walked under them the light also became green. A bee buzzed across their path. This is no thought, said the dwarf, suddenly stopping. This is spring. What are we to do? Your winter has been destroyed. I tell you, this is Oslan's doing. If either of you mention that name again, said the witch, he shall instantly be killed. Chapter 12 Peter's First Battle While the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away the beaver and the children were walking on hour after hour into what seemed a delicious dream. Long ago, they had left the coats behind them. And by now they had even stopped saying to one another, Look. There's a kingfisher, or I say, bluebells, or what was that lovely smell, or just listen to that thrush. They walked on in silence drinking it all in, passing through patches of warm sunlight into cool. Green thickets and out again into wide mossy glades where tall elms raised the leafy roof far overhead, and then into dense masses of flowering currant and among hawthorn bushes where the sweet smell was almost overpowering. They had been just as surprised as Redmond when they saw the winter vanishing and the whole wood passing in a few hours or so from January to May. They hadn't even known for certain that this was what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spells which had produced the endless winter, and therefore they all knew when this magic spring began that something had gone wrong, and badly wrong, with the witch's schemes. And after the talk had been going on for some time they all realized that the witch would no longer be able to use her sledge. After that they didn't hurry so much and they allowed themselves more rests and longer ones. They were pretty tired by now of course, but not what I'd call bitterly tired, only slow and feeling very dreamy and quiet inside, as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister on one heel. They had left the course of the big river some time ago, for one had to turn a little to the right to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been their way, they couldn't have kept to the river valley once the thaw began, for with all that melting snow the river was soon in flood, a wonderful, roaring, thundering yellow flood, and their path would have been underwater. And now the sun got low, and the light got redder, and the shadows got longer and the flowers began to think about closing. Not long now, said Mr. Beaver, and began leading them uphill across some very deep, springy moss in a place where only tall trees grew, very wide apart. The climb, coming at the end of the long day, made them all pant and blow. And just as Lucy was wondering whether she could really get to the top without another long rest, suddenly they were at the top. And this is what they sought. 
They were on a green open space, from which he could look down on the forest spreading, as far as one could see in every direction. Except right ahead. There, far to the east, was something twinkling and moving. By gum, whispered Peter to Susan. The sea. In the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great grim slab of grey stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very old, and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when you looked at them. The next thing they saw was a pavilion pitched on one side of the open place. A wonderful pavilion it was, and especially now when the light of the setting sun fell upon it. With sides of what looked like yellow silk and cords of crimson and ten pegs of ivory, and high above it on a pole a banner, which bore a red rampant lion. Fluttered in the breeze, which was blowing in their faces from the far off sea. While they were looking at this they heard a sound of music on their right, and turning in that direction they saw what they had come to see. Aslan stood in the center of a crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves around him in the shape of a half moon. There were tree women there and well women who had stringed instruments, it was they who had made the music. There were four great centaurs. The horse part of them was like huge English farm horses, and the man part was like stern but beautiful giants. There was also a unicorn, and a bull with the head of a man, and a pelican, and an eagle, and a great dog. And next to Aslan stood two leopards of whom one carried his crown and the other his standard. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of it now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes, and then they found they couldn't look at him and went all trembly. Go on whispered Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter, you first. No, sons of Adam before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver back again. Susan, whispered Peter, what about you? Ladies first. No, you're the eldest, whispered Susan. And of course, the longer they went on doing this the more awkward they felt. Then at last Peter realized that it was up to him. He drew his sword and raised it to the salute and hastily saying to the others, Come on. Pull yourselves together, he advanced to the lion and said, We have come, Aslan. Welcome, Peter, son of Adam, said Aslan. Welcome, Susan and Lucy, daughters of Eve. Welcome he beaver and she beaver. His voice was deep and rich and somehow took the fidgets out of them. They now felt glad and quiet, and it didn't seem awkward to them to stand and say nothing. But where is the fourth? asked Aslan. He has tried to betray them and joined the White Witch. Oh, Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. And then something made Peter say, That was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him, and I think that helped him to go wrong. And Aslan said nothing either to excuse Peter or to blame him, but merely stood looking at him with his great golden eyes. And it seemed to all of them that there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan. But it may be harder than you think. And then he was silent again for some time. Up to that moment Lucy had been thinking how royal and strong and peaceful his face looked, now it suddenly came into her head that he looked sad as well. But next minute that expression was quite gone. The lion shook his mane and clapped his paws together and said, Meanwhile, let the feast be prepared. Ladies, take these daughters of Eve to the pavilion and minister to them. When the girls had gone Aslan laid his paw and though it was velvet it was very heavy, on Peter's shoulder and said, Come, son of Adam, and I will show you a far off side of the castle where you are to be king. And Peter with his sword still drawn in his hand went with the lion to the eastern edge of the hilltop. Their beautiful sight met their eyes. The sun was setting behind their backs. 
That meant that the whole country below them lay in the evening light, forest, and hills and valleys and, winding away like a silver snake, the lower part of the great river. And beyond all this, miles away, was the sea, and beyond the sea the sky, full of clouds which were just turning rose color with the reflection of the sunset. But just where the land of Narnia met the sea, in fact, at the mouth of the great river, there was something on a little hill, shining. It was shining because it was a castle and of course the sunlight was reflected from all the windows which looked towards Peter and the sunset, but to Peter it looked like a great star resting on the seashore. That, O oh man, said Aslan, is Ker Paravel of the Four Thrones, in one of which you must sit as king. I show it to you because you are the firstborn and you will be high king over all the rest. And once more Peter said nothing, for at that moment a strange noise woke the silence suddenly. It was like a bugle, but richer. It is your sister's horn, said Aslan to Peter in a low voice, so low as to be almost a purr, if it is not disrespectful to think of a lion purring. For a moment, Peter did not understand. Then, when he saw all the other creatures start forward and heard Aslan say with a wave of his paw, back. Let the prince win his spurs, he did understand, and set off running as hard as he could to the pavilion. And there, he saw a dreadful sight. The naiads and dryads were scattering in every direction. Lucy was running towards him as fast as her short legs would carry her and her face was as white as paper. Then he saw Susan make a dash for a tree, and swing herself up, followed by a huge gray beast. At first, Peter thought it was a bear. Then he saw that it looked like an Alsatian, though it was far too big to be a dog. Then he realized that it was a wolf, a wolf standing on its hind legs, with its front paws against the tree trunk, snapping and snarling. All the hair on its back stood up on end. Susan had not been able to get higher than the second big branch. One of her legs hung down so that her foot was only an inch or two above the snapping teeth. Peter wondered why she did not get higher or at least take a better grip. Then he realized that she was just going to faint and that if she fainted she would fall off. Peter did not feel very brave, indeed, he felt he was going to be sick. But that made no difference to what he had to do. He rushed straight up to the monster and aimed a slash of his sword at its side. That stroke never reached the wolf. Quick as lightning it turned round, its eyes flaming, and its mouth wide open in a howl of anger. If it had not been so angry that it simply had to howl it would have got him by the throat at once. As it was, though all this happened too quickly for Peter to think at all, he had just time to duck down and plunge his sword, as hard as he could, between the brute's forelegs into its heart. Then came a horrible, confused moment like something in a nightmare. He was tugging and pulling and the wolf seemed neither alive nor dead, and its bared teeth knocked against his forehead and everything was blood and heat and hair. A moment later he found that the monster lay dead and he had drawn his sword out of it and was straightening his back and rubbing the sweat off his face and out of his eyes. He felt tired all over. Then, after a bit, Susan came down the tree. She and Peter felt pretty shaky when they met and I won't say there wasn't kissing and crying on both sides. But in Narnia, no one thinks any the worse of you for that. Quick! Quick! shouted the voice of Aslan, centaurs. Eagles! I see another wolf in the thickets. There, behind you. He has just darted away. After him, all of you. He will be going to his mistress. Now is your chance to find the witch and rescue the fourth son of Adam. And instantly with a thunder of hoofs and a beating of wings a dozen or so of the swiftest creatures disappeared into the gathering darkness. Peter, still out of breath, turned and saw Aslan close at hand. You have forgotten to clean your sword, said Aslan. It was true. Peter blushed when he looked at the bright blade and saw it all smeared with the wolf's hair and blood. He stooped down and wiped it quite clean on the grass and then wiped it quite dry on his coat. Hand it to me and kneel, son of Adam, said Aslan. And when Peter had done so he struck him with the flat of the blade and said, Rise up, Sir Peter Fenrisbane. And, 
Whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword. Chapter 13 Deep Magic From the Dawn of Time Now, we must go back to Edmund. When he had been made to walk far further than he had ever known that anybody could walk, the witch at last halted in a dark valley all overshadowed with fir trees and yew trees. Edmund simply sank down and lay on his face, doing nothing at all and not even caring what was going to happen next provided they would let him lie still. He was too tired even to notice how hungry and thirsty he was. The witch and the dwarf were talking close beside him in low tones. No, said the dwarf, it is no use now, O oh queen. They must have reached the stone table by now. Perhaps the wolf will smell us out and bring us news, said the witch. It cannot be good news if he does, said the dwarf. Four thrones in Care Paravel, said the witch. How if only three were filled? That would not fulfill the prophecy. What difference would that make now that he is here, said the dwarf. He did not dare, even now, to mention the name of Aslan to his mistress. He may not stay long. And then, we would fall upon the three at care. Yet it might be better, said the dwarf, to keep this one for bargaining with. Yes. And have him rescued said the witch scornfully. Then, said the dwarf, we had better do what we have to do at once. I would like to have done it on the stone table itself, said the witch. That is the proper place. That is where it has always been done before. It will be a long time now before the stone table can again be put to its proper use, said the dwarf. True, said the witch, and then, well, I will begin. At that moment, with a rush and a snarl a wolf rushed up to them. I have seen them. They are all at the stone table, with him. They have killed my captain, Fenrisulf. I was hidden in the thickets and saw it all. One of the sons of Adam killed him. Fly. Fly. No, said the witch. There need be no flooding. Go quickly. Summon all our people to meet me here as speedily as they can. Call out the giants and the werewolves and the spirits of those trees who are on our side. Call the ghouls and the boggles, the ogres and the minotaurs. Call the cruels, the hags, the specters and the people of the toadstools. We will fight. What? Have I not still my wand? Will not their ranks turn into stone even as they come on? Be off quickly, I have a little thing to finish here while you are away. The great brute bowed its head, turned, and galloped away. Now, said she, we have no table, let me see. We had better put it against the trunk of a tree. Edmund found himself being roughly forced to his feet. Then the dwarf set him with his back against a tree and bound him fast. He saw the witch take off her outer mantle. Her arms were bare underneath it and terribly white. Because they were so very white, he could not see much else. It was so dark in this valley under the dark trees. Prepare the victim, said the witch. And the dwarf undid Edmund's collar and folded back his shirt at the neck. Then he took Edmund's hair and pulled his head back so that he had to raise his chin. After that Edmund heard a strange noise, whiz, whiz, whiz. For a moment, he couldn't think what it was. Then, he realized. It was the sound of a knife being sharpened. At that very moment, he heard loud shouts from every direction, a drumming of hoofs and a beating of wings, a scream from the witch. Confusion all round him. And then he found he was being untied. Strong arms were round him, and he heard big, kind voices saying things like let him lie down, give him some wine. Drink this, steady now, you'll be all right in a minute. Then he heard the voices of people who were talking not to him, but to one another. And they were saying things like, who's got the witch? I thought you had her. I didn't see her after I knocked the knife out of her hand. I was after the dwarf. Do you mean to say she's escaped? A chap can't mind everything at once. What's that? Oh, sorry, it's only an old stump. But just at this point... Edmund went off in a dead faint. 
Presently the centaurs and unicorns and deer and birds all set off to go back to the stone table, carrying Edmund with them. But if they could have seen what happened in that valley after they had gone, I think they might have been surprised. It was perfectly still and presently the moon grew bright. If you had been there you would have seen the moonlight shining on an old tree stump and on a fair-sized boulder. But if you had gone on looking you would gradually have begun to think there was something odd about both the stump and the boulder. And next you would have thought that the stump did look really remarkably like a little fat man crouching on the ground. And if you had watched long enough you would have seen the stump walk across to the boulder and the boulder sit up and begin talking to the stump, for in reality the stump and the boulder were simply the witch and the dwarf. For it was part of her magic that she could make things look like what they weren't, and she had the presence of mind to do so at the very moment when the knife was knocked out of her hand. She had kept hold of her wand also, so it had been kept safe, too. When the other children woke up next morning the first thing they heard from Mrs. Beaver was that their brother had been rescued and brought into camp late last night and was at that moment with Aslan. As soon as they had breakfasted they all went out and there they saw Aslan and Edmund walking together in the dewy grass apart from the rest of the court. There is no need to tell you what Aslan was saying but it was a conversation which Edmund never forgot. As the others drew nearer Aslan turned to meet them bringing Edmund with him. Here is your brother, he said, and there is no need to talk to him about what is past. Edmund shook hands with each of the others and said to each of them in turn, I'm sorry, and everyone said that's all right. And then everyone wanted very hard to say something which would make it quite clear that they were all friends with him again, something ordinary and natural and of course no one could think of anything in the world to say. But before they had time to feel really awkward one of the leopards approached Aslan and said, Sire, there is a messenger from the enemy who craves audience. Let him approach, said Aslan. The leopard went away and soon returned leading the witch's dwarf. What is your message, son of earth? asked Aslan. The Queen of Narnia and Empress of the Lone Islands desires the safe conduct to come and speak with you, said the dwarf, on a matter which is as much to your advantage as to hers. Queen of Narnia, indeed, said Mr. Beaver. Of all the cheek. Peace, Beaver, said Aslan. All names will soon be restored to their proper owners. In the meantime, we will not dispute about noises. Tell your mistress, son of earth that I grant her safe conduct on condition that she leaves her wand behind her at that great oak. This was agreed to and two leopards went back with the dwarf to see that the conditions were properly carried out. But supposing she turns the two leopards into stone, whispered Lucy to Peter. I think the same idea had occurred to the leopards themselves, at any rate, as they walked off their fur was all standing upon their backs and their tails were bristling, like a cat's when it sees a strange dog. It'll be all right, whispered Peter in reply. He wouldn't send them if it weren't. A few minutes later the witch herself walked out onto the top of the hill and came straight across and stood before Aslan. The three children, who had not seen her before, felt shudders running down their backs at the side of her face, and there were low growls among all the animals present. Though it was bright sunshine, everyone felt suddenly cold. The only two people present who seemed to be quite at their ease were Aslan and the witch herself. It was the oddest thing to see those two faces, the golden face and the dead white face, so close together. Not that the witch looked Aslan exactly in his eyes, Mrs. Beaver particularly noticed this. You have a traitor there, Aslan, said the witch. Of course, everyone present knew that she meant Edmund. But Edmund had got past thinking about himself after all he'd been through and after the talk he'd had that morning. He just went on looking at Aslan. It didn't seem to matter what the witch said. Well, said Aslan. His offense was not against you. Have you forgotten the deep magic? asked the witch. Let us say I have forgotten it, answered Aslan gravely. Tell us of this deep magic. Trell you, said the witch her voice growing suddenly shriller. 
Tell you what is written on that very table of stone, which stands beside us? Tell you what is written in letters deep, as a spear is long on the trunk of the world ash tree? Tell you what is engraved, on the scepter of the emperor beyond the sea? You at least know the magic, which the emperor put into Narnia, at the very beginning. You know that every traitor belongs to me as my lawful prey, and that for every treachery I have a right to a kill. So, said Mr. Beaver. So that's how you came to imagine yourself a queen, because you were the emperor's hangman. I see. Peace, Beaver, said Aslan, with a very low growl. And so, continued the witch, that human creature is mine. His life is forfeit to me. His blood is my property. Come and take it then, said the bull, with the man's head, in a great bellowing voice. Fool, said the witch with a savage smile, that was almost a snarl. Do you really think your master can rob me of my rights by mere force? He knows the deep magic, better than that. He knows that unless I have blood as the law says all Narnia will be overturned and perish in fire and water. It is very true, said Aslan. I do not deny it. So, Aslan, whispered Susan in the lion's ear, can't we, I mean, you won't, will you? Can't we do something about the deep magic? Isn't there something you can work against it? Work against the emperor's magic, said Aslan turning to her with something like a frown on his face. And nobody ever made that suggestion to him again. Edmund was on the other side of Aslan, looking all the time at Aslan's face. He felt a choking feeling and wondered if he ought to say something, but a moment later he felt that he was not expected to do anything except to wait, and do what he was told. Fall back, all of you, said Aslan, and I will talk to the witch alone. They all obeyed. It was a terrible time this, waiting and wondering while the lion and the witch talked earnestly together in low voices. Lucy said, oh, Edmund, and began to cry. Peter stood with his back to the others looking out at the distant sea. The beavers stood holding each other's paws with their heads bowed. The centaurs stamped uneasily with their hoofs. But everyone became perfectly still in the end, so that you noticed even small sounds like a bumblebee flying past, or the birds in the forest down below them, or the wind rustling the leaves. And still the talk between Aslan and the white witch went on. At last, they heard Aslan's voice. You can all come back, he said. I have settled the matter. She has renounced the claim on your brother's blood. And all over the hill there was a noise as if everyone had been holding his breath and had now begun breathing again, and then a murmur of talk. They began to come back to Aslan's throne. The witch was just turning away with a look of fierce joy on her face when she stopped and said, But how do I know this promise will be kept? Wow roared Aslan half rising from his throne, and his great mouth opened wider and wider and the roar grew louder and louder, and the witch, after staring for a moment with her lips wide apart, picked up her skirts and fairly ran for her life. Chapter 14 The Triumph of the Witch As soon as the witch had gone Aslan said, We must move from this place at once, it will be wanted for other purposes. We shall encamp tonight at the fords of Verona. Of course, everyone was dying to ask him how he had arranged matters with the witch, but his face was stern and everyone's ears were still ringing with the sound of his roar, and so nobody dared. After a meal, which was taken in the open air on the hilltop they were busy for a while taking the pavilion down and packing things up. Before two o'clock they were on the march and set off in a northwesterly direction, walking at an easy pace for they had not far to go. During the first part of the journey Aslan explained to Peter his plan of campaign. As soon as she has finished her business in these parts, he said, the witch and her crew will almost certainly fall back to her house and prepare for a siege. You may or may not be able to cut her off and prevent her from reaching it. He then went on to outline two plans of battle, one for fighting the witch and her people in the wood and another for assaulting her castle and all the time he was advising Peter how to conduct the operations, saying things like, you must put your centaurs in such and such a place or you must post scouts to see that she doesn't do so and so, till at last Peter said. But you will be there yourself, 
Aslan. I can give you no promise of that, answered the lion. And he continued, giving Peter his instructions. For the last part of the journey, it was Susan and Lucy who saw most of him. He did not talk very much, and seemed to them to be sad. It was still afternoon, when they came down to a place, where the river valley, had widened out and the river was broad and shallow. This was the fords of Bruna, and Aslan gave orders to halt, on this side of the water. But, Peter said, Wouldn't it be better to camp on the far side, for fear she should try a night attack or anything? Aslan, who seemed to have been thinking about something else, roused himself with a shake of his magnificent mane and said, A. What's that? Peter said it all over again. No, said Aslan, in a dull voice, as if it didn't matter. No. She will not make an attack tonight. And then, he sighed deeply. But presently he added, all the same it was well thought of. That is how a soldier ought to think. But it doesn't really matter. So they proceeded to pitch their camp. Oslin's mood affected everyone that evening. Peter was feeling uncomfortable too at the idea of fighting the battle on his own. The news that Aslan might not be there had come as a great shock to him. Supper that evening was a quiet meal. Everyone felt how different it had been last night or even that morning. It was as if the good times, having just begun, were already drawing to their end. This feeling affected Susan so much that she couldn't get to sleep when she went to bed. And after she had lain counting sheep and turning over and over she heard Lucy give a long sigh and turn over just beside her in the darkness. Can't you get to sleep, either, said Susan. No, said Lucy. I thought you were asleep. I say, Susan. What? I've a most horrible feeling, as if something were hanging over us. Have you? Because, as a matter of fact, so have I. Something about Aslan, said Lucy. Either some dreadful thing that is going to happen to him, or something dreadful that he's going to do. There's been something wrong with him all afternoon, said Susan. Lucy? What was that he said about not being with us at the battle? You don't think he could be stealing away and leaving us tonight, do you? Where is he now? said Lucy. Is he here, in the pavilion? I don't think so. Susan. Let's go outside and have a look round. We might see him. All right. Let's, said Susan, we might just as well be doing that as lying awake here. Very quietly the two girls groped their way among the other sleepers and crept out of the tent. The moonlight was bright, and everything was quite still except for the noise of the river chattering over the stones. Then Susan suddenly caught Lucy's arm and said, Look. On the far side of the camping ground, just where the trees began, they saw the lion slowly walking away from them into the wood. Without a word, they both followed him. He led them up the steep slope out of the river valley and then slightly to the left apparently by the very same route which they had used that afternoon in coming from the hill of the stone table. On and on he led them, into dark shadows and out into pale moonlight, getting their feet wet with the heavy dew. He looked somehow different from the Aslan they knew. His tail and his head hung low and he walked slowly as if he were very, very tired. Then, when they were crossing a wide open place where there were no shadows for them to hide in, he stopped and looked round. It was no good trying to run away, so they came towards him. When they were closer he said, So, children, children, why are you following me? We couldn't sleep, said Lucy, and then felt sure that she need say no more and that Aslan knew all they had been thinking. Please, may we come with you, wherever you're going, said Susan. Well, said Aslan, and seemed to be thinking. Then he said, I should be glad of company tonight. Yes, you may come, if you will promise to stop when I tell you, and after that leave me to go on alone. So, thank you, thank you. And we will, said the two girls. Forward they went again, and one of the girls walked on each side of the lion. But how slowly he walked. And his great, royal head drooped so that his nose nearly touched the grass. 
Presently, he stumbled and gave a low moan. Aslan. Dear Aslan, said Lucy, what is wrong? Can't you tell us? Are you ill, dear Aslan, asked Susan. No, said Aslan. I am sad and lonely. Lay your hands on my mane so that I can feel you are there and let us walk like that. And so the girls did what they would never have dared to do without his permission but what they had longed to do ever since they first saw him, buried their cold hands in the beautiful sea of fur and stroked it and, so doing, walked with him. And presently they saw that they were going with him up the slope of the hill on which the stone table stood. They went up at the side where the trees came furthest up, and when they got to the last tree Aslan stopped and said, So, oh, children, children. Here you must stop. And whatever happens, do not let yourselves be seen. Farewell. And both the girls cried bitterly and clung to the lion and kissed his mane and his nose and his paws and his great, sad eyes. Then he turned from them and walked out onto the top of the hill. And Lucy and Susan, crouching in the bushes, looked after him and this is what they saw. A great crowd of people were standing all round the stone table, and though the moon was shining many of them carried torches, which burned with evil-looking red flames and black smoke. But such people, ogres with monstrous teeth, and wolves, and bull-headed men, spirits of evil trees, and poisonous plants, and other creatures whom I won't describe, because if I did the grown-ups would probably not let you read this book, cruels, and hags, and incubuses, wraiths. Horrors. Ephrates, Sprites, Orkneys, Boozes, and Edens. In fact here were all those who were on the witch's side and whom the wolf had summoned at her command. And right in the middle, standing by the table, was the witch herself. A howl and a gibber of dismay went up from the creatures when they first saw the great lion pacing towards them, and for a moment the witch herself seemed to be struck with fear. Then she recovered herself and gave a wild, fierce laugh. The fool, she cried. The fool has come. Find him, fast. Lucy and Susan held their breaths, waiting for Oslin's roar and his spring upon his enemies. But it never came. Four hags, grinning and leering, yet also hanging back and half afraid of what they had to do, had approached him. Bind him, I say, repeated the white witch. The hags made a dart at him and shrieked with triumph when they found that he made no resistance at all. Then others, evil dwarfs and apes, rushed in to help them and between them they rolled the huge lion round on his back and tied all his four paws together, shouting and cheering as if they had done something brave, though, had the lion chosen. One of those paws could have been the death of them all. But he made no noise, even when the enemies, straining and tugging, pulled the cords so tight that they cut into his flesh. Then they began to drag him towards the stone table. Stop, said the witch. Let him first be shaved. Another roar of mean laughter went up from her followers as an ogre with a pair of shears came forward and squatted down by Oslin's head. Snip 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 went the shears and masses of curling gold began to fall to the ground. Then the ogre stood back and the children, watching from their hiding place, could see the face of Aslan looking all small and different without its mane. The enemies also saw the difference. Why, he's only a great cat, after all, cried one. Is that what we were afraid of, said another. And they surged round Aslan, jeering at him, saying things like puss, puss. Poor pussy, and how many mice have you caught today, cat, and would you like a saucer of milk, pussums? Oh, how can they, said Lucy, tears streaming down her cheeks. The brutes, the brutes, for now that the first shock was over the shorn face of Aslan looked to her braver, and more beautiful, and more patient than ever. Muzzle him, said the witch. And even now, as they worked about his face putting on the muzzle, one bite from his jaws would have cost two or three of them their hands. But he never moved. And this seemed to enrage all that rabble. Everyone was at him now. Those who had been afraid to come near him even after he was bound began to find their courage, and for a few minutes the two girls could not even see him, so thickly was he surrounded by the whole crowd of creatures kicking him, hitting him, spitting on him, 
jeering at him. At last the rabble had had enough of this. They began to drag the bound and muzzled lion to the stone table, some pulling and some pushing. He was so huge that even when they got him there it took all their efforts to hoist him onto the surface of it. Then there was more tying and tightening of cords. The cowards! The cowards! sobbed Susan. Are they still afraid of him, even now? When once Aslan had been tied on the flat stone, a hush fell on the crowd. Four hags, holding four torches, stood at the corners of the table. The witch bared her arms as she had bared them the previous night when it had been Edmund instead of Aslan. Then she began to wet her knife. It looked to the children when the gleam of the torchlight fell on it, as if the knife were made of stone not of steel and it was of a strange and evil shape. At last she drew near. She stood by Aslan's head. Her face was working and twitching with passion, but his looked up at the sky, still quiet, neither angry nor afraid, but a little sad. Then, just before she gave the blow, she stooped down and said in a quivering voice, And now, who has won? Fool, did you think that by all this you would save the human traitor? Now I will kill you instead of him as our pact was and so the deep magic will be appeased. But when you are dead, what will prevent me from killing him as well? And who will take him out of my hand then? Understand that you have given me Narnia forever, you have lost your own life and you have not saved his. In that knowledge, despair and die. The children did not see the actual moment of the killing. They couldn't bear to look and had covered their eyes. Chapter 15 Deeper magic from before the dawn of time, while the two girls still crouched in the bushes with their hands over their faces, they heard the voice of the witch calling out. Now, follow me all and we will set about what remains of this war. It will not take us long to crush the human vermin and the traitors now that the great fool, the great cat, lies dead. At this moment, the children were for a few seconds in very great danger. For with wild cries and a noise of skirling pipes and shrill horns blowing, the whole of that vile rabble came sweeping off the hilltop and down the slope right past their hiding place. They felt the specters go by them like a cold wind, and they felt the ground shape beneath them under the galloping feet of the minotaurs, and overhead there went a flurry of foul wings and a blackness of vultures and giant bats. At any other time they would have trembled with fear. But now the sadness and shame and horror of Oslin's death so filled their minds that they hardly thought of it. As soon as the wood was silent again Susan and Lucy crept out into the open hilltop. The moon was getting low and thin clouds were passing across her, but still they could see the shape of the great lion lying dead in his bonds. And down they both knelt in the wet grass and kissed his cold face and stroked his beautiful fur, what was left of it, and cried till they could cry no more. And then they looked at each other and held each other's hands for mere loneliness and cried again, and then again were silent. At last, Lucy said, I can't bear the look of that horrible muzzle. I wonder could we take it off? So they tried. And after a lot of working at it they succeeded. And when they saw his face without it they burst out crying again and kissed it and fondled it and wiped away the blood and the foam as well as they could. And it was all more lonely and hopeless and horrid than I know how to describe. I wonder could we untie him as well, said Susan presently. But the enemies, out of pure spitefulness had drawn the cord so tight that the girls could make nothing of the knots. I hope no one who reads this book has been quite as miserable as Susan and Lucy were that night, but if you have been, if you've been up all night and cried till you have no more tears left in you you will know that there comes in the end a sort of quietness. You feel as if nothing was ever going to happen again. At any rate that was how it felt to these two. Hours and hours seemed to go by in this dead calm, and they hardly noticed that they were getting colder and colder. But at last Lucy noticed two other things. One was that the sky on the east side of the hill was a little less dark than it had been an hour ago. The other was some tiny movement going on in the grass at her feet. At first, she took no interest in this. What did it matter? Nothing mattered now. 
But at last she saw that whatever it was had begun to move at the upright stones of the stone table. And now whatever they were were moving about on Oslin's body. She peered closer. They were little, grey things. Ugh, said Susan from the other side of the table. How beastly. There are horrid, little mice crawling over him. Go away, you little beasts. And she raised her hand to frighten them away. Wait, said Lucy who had been looking at them more closely still. Can you see what they're doing? Both girls bent down and stared. I do believe, said Susan. But how queer. They're nibbling away at the cords. That's what I thought, said Lucy. I think they're friendly mice. Poor little things, they don't realize he's dead. They think it'll do some good untying him. It was quite definitely lighter by now. Each of the girls noticed for the first time the white face of the other. They could see the mice nibbling away, dozens and dozens, even hundreds, of little field mice. And at last, one by one, the ropes were all gnawed through. The sky in the east was whitish by now and the stars were getting fainter, all except one very big one low down on the eastern horizon. They felt colder than they had been all night. The mice crept away again. The girls cleared away the remains of the gnawed ropes. Aslan looked more like himself without them. Every moment his dead face looked nobler as the light grew and they could see it better. In the wood behind them a bird gave a chuckling sound. It had been so still for hours and hours that it startled them. Then another bird answered it. Soon, there were birds singing all over the place. It was quite definitely early morning, now, not late night. I'm so cold, said Lucy. So am I, said Susan. Let's walk about a bit. They walked to the eastern edge of the hill and looked down. The one big star had almost disappeared. The country all looked dark grey, but beyond, at the very end of the world, the sea showed pale. The sky began to turn red. They walked to and fro more times than they could count between the dead Aslan and the eastern ridge, trying to keep warm, and oh, how tired their legs felt. Then at last, as they stood for a moment looking out towards the sea and Care Paravel the red turned to gold along the line where the sea and the sky met, and very slowly up came the edge of the sun. At that moment they heard from behind them a loud noise, a great cracking, deafening noise, as if a giant had broken a giant's plate. What's that? said Lucy, clutching Susan's arm. I, I feel afraid to turn round, said Susan, something awful is happening. They're doing something worse to him, said Lucy. Come on. And she turned, pulling Susan round with her. The rising of the sun had made everything look so different, all the colors and shadows were changed, that for a moment they didn't see the important thing. Then, they did. The stone table was broken into two pieces by a great crack that ran down it from end to end, and there was no Aslan. Oh, 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 cried the two girls rushing back to the table. Oh, it's too bad, sobbed Lucy, they might have left the body alone. Who's done it? cried Susan. What does it mean? Is it more magic? Yes, said a great voice behind their backs. It is more magic. They looked round. There, shining in the sunrise, larger than they had seen him before, shaking his mane stood Aslan himself. So, Aslan, cried both the children, staring up at him, almost as much frightened as they were glad. Aren't you dead then, dear Aslan? said Lucy. Not now, said Aslan. You're not, not eh? asked Susan in a shaky voice. She couldn't bring herself to say the word ghost. Aslan stooped his golden head and licked her forehead. The warmth of his breath and a rich sort of smell that seemed to hang about his hair came all over her. Do I look it, he said. So, you're real, you're real. So, Aslan, cried Lucy and both girls flung themselves upon him and covered him with kisses. But what does it all mean? asked Susan when they were somewhat calmer. It means, said Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still which she did not know. 
her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked a little further back, into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. And now... Oh yes. Now, said Lucy jumping up and clapping her hands. So, children, said the lion, I feel my strength coming back to me. So, children, catch me if you can. He stood for a second, his eyes very bright, his limbs quivering lashing himself with his tail. Then he made a leak hide over their heads and landed on the other side of the table. Laughing, though she didn't know why, Lucy scrambled over it to reach him. Aslan leaped again. A mad chase began. Round and round the hilltop he led them, now hopelessly out of their reach, now letting them almost catch his tail, now diving between them now tossing them in the air with his huge and beautifully velvet paws and catching them again. And now stopping unexpectedly so that all three of them rolled over together in a happy laughing heap of fur and arms and legs. It was such a romp as no one has ever had except in Narnia, and whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm or playing with a kitten Lucy could never make up her mind. And the funny thing was that when all three finally lay together panting in the sun the girls no longer felt in the least tired or hungry or thirsty. And now, said Aslan presently, to business. I feel I am going to roar. You had better put your fingers in your ears. And they did. And Aslan stood up and when he opened his mouth to roar his face became so terrible that they did not dare to look at it. And they saw all the trees in front of him bend before the blast of his roaring as grass bends in a meadow before the wind. Then, he said, We have a long journey to go. You must ride on me. And he crouched down and the children climbed onto his warm, golden back and Susan sat first holding on tightly to his mane and Lucy sat behind holding on tightly to Susan. And with a great heave he rose underneath them and then shot off, faster than any horse could go downhill and into the thick of the forest. That ride was perhaps the most wonderful thing that happened to them in Narnia. Have you ever had a gallop on a horse? Think of that, and then take away the heavy noise of the hoofs and the jingle of the harness and imagine instead the almost noiseless padding of the great paws. Then imagine instead of the black or gray or chestnut back of the horse the soft roughness of golden fur, and the mane flying back in the wind. And then imagine you are going about twice as fast as the fastest race horse. But this is a mount that doesn't need to be guided and never grows tired. He rushes on and on, never missing his footing, never hesitating, threading his way with perfect skill between tree trunks, jumping over bush and briar and the smaller streams, wading the larger, swimming the largest of all. And you are riding not on a road nor in a park nor even on the downs but ride across Narnia. In spring, down solemn avenues of beech and across sunny glades of oak, through wild orchards of snow-white cherry trees, past roaring waterfalls and mossy rocks and echoing caverns. Up windy slopes alight with gorse bushes and across the shoulders of heathery mountains and along giddy ridges and down, down, down again into wild valleys and out into acres of blue flowers. It was nearly midday when they found themselves looking down a steep hillside at a castle. A little toy castle it looked from where they stood, which seemed to be all pointed towers. But the lion was rushing down at such a speed that it grew larger every moment and before they had time even to ask themselves what it was they were already on a level with it. And now it no longer looked like a toy castle but rose frowning in front of them. No face looked over the battlements and the gates were fast shut. And Aslan, not at all slacking his pace, rushed straight as a bullet towards it. The witch is home, he cried. Now, children, hold tight. Next moment the whole world seemed to turn upside down, and the children felt as if they had left their insides behind them. For the lion had gathered himself together for a greater leap than any he had yet made and jumped, or you may call it flying rather than jumping. Right over the castle wall. The two girls, breathless but unhurt, 
found themselves tumbling off his back in the middle of a wide stone courtyard, full of statues. Chapter 16 What Happened About the Statues What an extraordinary place, cried Lucy. All those stone animals, and people too. It's, it's like a museum. Hush, said Susan, Hosland's doing something. He was, indeed. He had bounded up to the stone lion and breathed on him. Then without waiting a moment he whisked round, almost as if he had been a cat chasing its tail, and breathed also on the stone dwarf, which was standing a few feet from the lion with his back to it. Then he pounced on a tall stone dryad, which stood beyond the dwarf, turned rapidly aside to deal with a stone rabbit on his right, and rushed on to two centaurs. But at that moment, Lucy said, So, Susan, look, look at the lion. I expect you've seen someone put a lighted match to a bit of newspaper, which is propped up in a grate against an unlit fire. And for a second nothing seems to have happened, and then you notice a tiny streak of flame creeping along the edge of the newspaper. It was like that now. For a second after Aslan had breathed upon him the stone lion looked just the same. Then a tiny streak of gold began to run along his white marble back, then it spread. Then the color seemed to lick all over him as the flame licks all over a bit of paper. Then, while his hindquarters were still obviously stone the lion shook his mane and all the heavy stony folds rippled into living hair. Then he opened a great red mouth, warm and living, and gave a prodigious yawn. And now his hind legs had come to life. He lifted one of them and scratched himself. Then, having caught sight of Aslan, he went bounding after him and frisking round him whimpering with delight and jumping up to lick his face. Of course the children's eyes turned to follow the lion, but the sight they saw was so wonderful that they soon forgot about him. Everywhere the statues were coming to life. The courtyard looked no longer like a museum, it looked more like a zoo. Creatures were running after Aslan and dancing round him till he was almost hidden in the crowd. Instead of all that deadly white the courtyard was now a blaze of colors, glossy chestnut sides of centaurs, indigo horns of unicorns, dazzling plumage of birds, ready brown of foxes, dogs, and satyrs, yellow stockings and crimson hoods of dwarfs, and the birch girls in silver, and the beach girls in fresh, transparent green, and the large girls in green, so bright that it was almost yellow. And instead of the deadly silence the whole place rang with the sound of happy roarings, braidings, yelpings, barkings, squillings, cooings, neighings, stampings, shouts, hurrahs, songs and laughter. Who, said Susan in a different tone. Look. I wonder, I mean, is it safe? Lucy looked and saw that Aslan had just breathed on the feet of the stone giant. It's all right shouted Aslan joyously. Once the feet are put right, all the rest of him will follow. That wasn't exactly what I meant, whispered Susan to Lucy. But it was too late to do anything about it now, even if Aslan would have listened to her. The change was already creeping up the giant's legs. Now he was moving his feet. A moment later he lifted the club off his shoulder, rubbed his eyes, and said, Bless me. I must have been asleep. Now, where's that dragged little witch that was running about on the ground? Somewhere just by my feet, it was. But when everyone had shouted up to him to explain what had really happened, and when the giant had put his hand to his ear and got them to repeat it all again so that at last he understood. Then he bowed down till his head was no further off than the top of a haystack and touched his cap repeatedly to Aslan beaming all over his honest ugly face. Now for the inside of this house, said Aslan. Look, alive, everyone. Upstairs and downstairs and in my lady's chamber. Leave no corner unsearched. You never know where some poor prisoner may be concealed. And into the interior, they all rushed, and for several minutes the whole of that dark, horrible, Dusty old castle echoed with the opening of windows and with everyone's voices crying out at once, Don't forget the dungeons. Give us a hand with this door. Here's another little winding stair, though. I say. Here's a poor little kangaroo. 
Call Aslan. Phew. How it smells in here. Look out for trapdoors up here. There are a whole lot more on the landing. But the best of all was when Lucy came rushing upstairs shouting out. Aslan. Aslan. I've found Mr. Tumnus. So, do come, quick. A moment later Lucy and the little thong were holding one another by both hands and dancing round and round for joy. The little chap was none the worse for having been a statue and was of course very interested in all she had to tell him. But at last the ransacking of the witch's fortress was ended. The whole castle stood empty with every door and window open and the light and the sweet spring air flooding into all the dark and evil places which needed them so badly. The whole crowd of liberated statues surged back into the courtyard. And it was then that someone first said, But how are we going to get out? For Aslan had got in by a jump and the gates were still locked. That'll be all right, said Aslan, and then, rising on his hind legs, he bawled up at the giant. Hi! You up there, he roared. What's your name? Giant Rumblebuffin, if it please your honor, said the giant, once more touching his cap. Well then, Giant Rumblebuffin, said Aslan, just let us out of this, will you? Certainly, your honor. It will be a pleasure said Giant Rumblebuffin. Stand well away from the gates, all you little UNS. Then he strode to the gate himself, and bang, 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 went his huge club. The gates creaked at the first blow, cracked at the second, and shivered at the third. Then he tackled the towers on each side of them and after a few minutes of crashing and thudding both the towers and a good bit of the wall on each side went thundering down in a mass of hopeless rubble, and when the dust cleared it was odd, standing in that dry, grim, stony yard. To see through the gap, all the grass and waving trees and sparkling streams of the forest, and the blue hills beyond that and beyond them the sky. Blowed if I ain't all in a muck sweat, said the giant puffing like the largest railway engine. Comes of being out of condition. I suppose neither of you young ladies has such a thing as a pocket and kerchief about you? Yes. I have, said Lucy standing on tiptoes and holding her handkerchief up as far as she could reach. Thank you, Missy, said Giant Rumblebuffin, stooping down. Next moment Lucy got rather a fright, for she found herself caught up in midair between the giant's finger and thumb. But just as she was getting near his face he suddenly started and then put her gently back on the ground muttering, Bless me. I've picked up the little girl instead. I beg your pardon, Missy, I thought you was the handkerchief. No, no, said Lucy laughing, here it is. This time he managed to get it but it was only about the same size to him that a saccharine tablet would be to you, so that when she saw him solemnly rubbing it to and fro across his great red face, she said, I'm afraid it's not much use to you, Mr. Rumblebuffin. Not at all. Not at all, said the giant politely. Never met a nicer handkerchief. So fine, so handy. So, I don't know how to describe it. What a nice giant he is, said Lucy to Mr. Tumnus. Oh yes, replied the fawn. All the buffins always were. One of the most respected of all the giant families in Narnia. Not very clever, perhaps, but an old family. With traditions, you know. If he'd been the other sort, she'd never have turned him into stone. At this point Aslan clapped his paws together and called for silence. Our day's work is not yet over, he said, and if the witch is to be finally defeated before bedtime we must find the battle at once. And join in I hope, sir, added the largest of the centaurs. Of course, said Aslan. And now, those who can't keep up, that is, children, Dwarfs, and small animals, must ride on the backs of those who can, that is, lions, centaurs, unicorns, horses, giants, and eagles. Those who are good with their noses must come in the front with us lions to smell out where the battle is. Look, lively and sort yourselves. And with a great deal of bustle and cheering they did. The most pleased of the lot was the other lion, 
who kept running about everywhere pretending to be very busy, but really in order to say to everyone he met, Did you hear what he said? Us lions. That means him and me. Us lions. That's what I like about Aslan. No side, no standoffishness. Us lions. That meant him and me. At least he went on saying this till Aslan had loaded him up with three dwarfs, one dryad, two rabbits, and a hedgehog. That steadied him a bit. When all were ready, they set out through the gap in the castle wall. At first the lions and dogs went nosing about in all directions. But then suddenly one great hound picked up the scent and gave a bay. There was no time lost after that. Soon all the dogs and lions and wolves and other hunting animals were going at full speed with their noses to the ground, and all the others, streaked out for about half a mile behind them, were following as fast as they could. The noise was like an English fox hunt only better because every now and then with the music of the hounds was mixed the roar of the other lion and sometimes the far deeper and more awful roar of Aslan himself. Faster and faster they went as the scent became easier and easier to follow. And then, just as they came to the last curve in a narrow, winding valley, Lucy heard above all these noises another noise, a different one, which gave her a queer feeling inside. It was a noise of shouts and shrieks and of the clashing of metal against metal. Then they came out of the narrow valley and at once she saw the reason. There stood Peter and Edmund and all the rest of Oslin's army fighting desperately against the crowd of horrible creatures whom she had seen last night, only now in the daylight, they looked even stranger and more evil and more deformed. There also seemed to be far more of them. Oslin's army, which had their backs to her, looked terribly few. And there were statues dotted all over the battlefield, so apparently the witch had been using her wand. But she did not seem to be using it now. She was fighting with her stone knife. It was Peter she was fighting both of them going at it so hard that Lucy could hardly make out what was happening, she only saw the stone knife and Peter's sword flashing so quickly that they looked like three knives and three swords. That pair were in the center. On each side the line stretched out. Horrible things were happening wherever she looked. Off my back, children, shouted Aslan. And they both tumbled off. Then with a roar that shook all Narnia from the western lamppost to the shores of the eastern sea the great beast flung himself upon the white witch. Lucy saw her face lifted towards him for one second with an expression of terror and amazement. Then lion and witch had rolled over together but with the witch underneath, and at the same moment all warlike creatures whom Aslan had led from the witch's house rushed madly on the enemy's line, dwarfs with their battle axes, dogs with teeth. The giant with his club unicorns, with their horns, centaurs with swords and hoofs. And Peter's tired army cheered, and the newcomers roared, and the enemy squealed and gibbered till the wood re-echoed with the din of that onset. Chapter 17 The Hunting of the White Stag The battle was all over a few minutes after their arrival. Most of the enemy had been killed in the first charge of Aslan and his companions, and when those who were still living saw that the witch was dead they either gave themselves up or took to flight. The next thing that Lucy knew was that Peter and Aslan were shaking hands. It was strange to her to see Peter looking as he looked now, his face was so pale and stern and he seemed so much older. It was all Edmund's doing, Aslan, Peter was saying. We'd have been beaten if it hadn't been for him. The witch was turning our troops into stone right and left. But nothing would stop him. He fought his way through three ogres to where she was just turning one of your leopards into a statue. And when he reached her he had the sense to bring his sword smashing down on her wand instead of trying to go for her directly and simply getting made a statue himself for his pains. That was the mistake all the rest were making. Once her wand was broken we began to have some chance, if we hadn't lost so many already. He was terribly wounded. We must go and see him. They found Edmund in charge of Mrs. Beaver, a little way back from the fighting line. He was covered with blood, his mouth was open, and his face a nasty green color. Quick, Lucy, said Aslan. And then, 
Almost for the first time, Lucy remembered the precious cordial that had been given her for a Christmas present. Her hands trembled so much that she could hardly undo the stopper, but she managed it in the end and poured a few drops into her brother's mouth. There are other people wounded, said Aslan, while she was still looking eagerly into Edmund's pale face and wondering if the cordial would have any result. Yes, I know, said Lucy Crosley. Wait a minute. Daughter of Eve, said Aslan, in a graver voice, others also are at the point of death. Must more people die for Edmund? I'm sorry, Aslan, said Lucy getting up and going with him. And for the next half hour they were busy, she attending to the wounded while he restored those who had been turned into stone. When at last she was free to come back to Edmund she found him standing on his feet and not only healed of his wounds but looking better than she had seen him look, though, for ages, in fact ever since his first term at that horrid school which was where he had begun to go wrong. He had become his real old self again and could look you in the face. And there, on the field of battle, Aslan made him a knight. Does he know, whispered Lucy to Susan, what Aslan did for him? Does he know what the arrangement with the witch really was? Hush. No. Of course not, said Susan. Oughtn't he to be told, said Lucy. No, surely not, said Susan. It would be too awful for him. Think how you'd feel if you were he. All the same, I think he ought to know, said Lucy. But at that moment, they were interrupted. That night they slept where they were. How Aslan provided food for them all I don't know, but somehow or other they found themselves all sitting down on the grass to a fine high tea at about eight o'clock. Next day they began marching eastward, down the side of the great river. And the next day after that, at about tea time, they actually reached the mouth. The castle of Care Paravel on its little hill towered up above them. Before them were the sands, with rocks, and little pools of salt water, and seaweed, and the smell of the sea, and long miles of bluish-green waves breaking forever and ever on the beach. And, oh, the cry of the seagulls. Have you heard it? Can you remember? That evening after tea the four children all managed to get down to the beach again and get their shoes and stockings off and feel the sand between their toes. But next day was more solemn. For then, in the great hall of Care Paravel, that wonderful hall with the ivory roof and the west door all hung with peacock's feathers and the eastern door which opens right onto the sea, in the presence of all their friends and to the sound of trumpets. Aslan solemnly crowned them and led them onto the four thrones, amid deafening shouts of, Long live King Peter! Long live Queen Susan! Long live King Edmund! Long live Queen Lucy! Once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen. Bear it well, sons of Adam. Bear it well, daughters of Eve, said Aslan. And through the eastern door, which was wide open came the voices of the mermen and the mermaids swimming close to the castle steps and singing in honor of their new kings and queens. So the children sat in their thrones and scepters were put into their hands and they gave rewards and honors to all their friends to Tumnus the fawn, and to the beavers, and giant Rumblebuffin, to the leopards, and the good centaurs, and the good dwarfs, and to the lion. And that night there was a great feast in Care Paravel, and revelry, and dancing, and gold flashed and wine flowed, and answering to the music inside, but stranger, sweeter, and more piercing, came the music of the sea people. But amidst all these rejoicings Aslan himself quietly slipped away, and when the kings and queens noticed that he wasn't there they said nothing about it. For Mr. Beaver had warned them, he'll be coming and going he had said. One day you'll see him and another you won't. He doesn't like being tied down, and of course he has other countries to attend to. It's quite all right. He'll often drop in. Only you mustn't press him. He's wild, you know. Not like a tame lion. And now, as you see, this story is nearly at an end. These two kings and two queens governed Narnia well and long and happy was their reign. At first much of their time was spent in seeking out the remnants of the White Witch's army and destroying them, 
and indeed for a long time there would be news of evil things lurking in the wilder parts of the forest, a haunting here and a killing there. A glimpse of a werewolf one month, and a rumor of a had the next. But in the end, all that foul brood was stamped out. And they made good laws and kept the peace and saved good trees from being unnecessarily cut down, and liberated young dwarfs and young satyrs from being sent to school. And generally stopped busybodies and interferers and encouraged ordinary people who wanted to live and let live. And they drove back the fierce giants on the north of Narnia when these ventured across the frontier. And they entered into friendship and alliance with countries beyond the sea and paid them visits of state and received visits of state from them. And they themselves grew and changed as the years passed over them. And Peter became a tall and deep chested man and a great warrior and he was called King Peter the Magnificent. And Susan grew into a tall and gracious woman with black hair that fell almost to her feet and the kings of the countries beyond the sea began to send ambassadors asking for her hand in marriage. And she was called Queen Susan the Gentle. Edmund was a graver and quieter man than Peter, and great in counsel and judgment. He was called King Edmund the Just. But as for Lucy, she was always gay and golden-haired, and all princes in those parts desired her to be their queen, and her own people called her Queen Lucy the Valiant. So they lived in great joy, and if ever they remembered their life in this world it was only as one remembers a dream. And one year it fell out that Tumnus came down river, and brought them news that the White Stag had once more appeared in his parts, the White Staff who would give you wishes if you caught him. So these two kings and two queens with the principal members of their court, rode a hunting with horns and hounds in the western woods to follow the white stag. And they had not hunted long before they had a sight of him. And he led them a great pace over rough and smooth and through thick and thin, till the horses of all the courtiers were tired out and only these four were still following. And they saw the stag enter into a thicket where their horses could not follow. Then said King Peter fair consorts, let us now alight from our horses and follow this beast into the thicket, for in all my days I never hunted a nobler quarry. Sir, said the others, even so let us do. So they alighted and tied their horses to trees and went on into the thick wood on foot. And as soon as they had entered it, Queen Susan said, Fair friends, here is a great marvel, for I seem to see a tree of iron. Madam, said King Edmund, if you look well upon it you shall see it is a pillar of iron with a lantern set on the top thereof. Mary, a strange device, said King Peter, to set a lantern here where the trees cluster so thick about it and so high above it that if it were lit it should give light to no man. Sir, said Queen Lucy, by likelihood when this post and this lamp were set here there were smaller trees in the place, or fewer, or none. For this is a young wood and the iron post is old. And they stood looking upon it. Then said King Edmund, I know not how it is, but this lamp on the post worketh upon me strangely. It runs in my mind that I have seen the like before, as it were in a dream, or in the dream of a dream. Sir, answered they all, it is even so with us also. And more, said Queen Lucy, for it will not go out of my mind that if we pass this post and lantern, Either we shall find strange adventures, or else some great change of our fortunes. Madam, said King Edmund, the like foreboding stirreth in my heart also. And in mine, fair brother, said King Peter. And in mine, too, said Queen Susan. Wherefore by my counsel we shall lightly return to our horses and follow this white stag no further. Madam, said King Peter, therein I pray thee to have me excused. For never since we four were kings and queens in Narnia have we set our hands to any high matter, as battles, quests, feats of arms, acts of justice, and the like, and then given over, but always what we have taken in hand, the same we have achieved. Sister, said Queen Lucy, my royal brother speaks rightly. And it seems to me we should be shamed if for any fearing or foreboding we turned back from following so noble a beast as now we have in chase. And so say, I, said King Edmund. And I have such desire to find the signification of this thing that I would not by my good will turn back for the richest jewel in all Narnia and all the islands. 
Then in the name of Aslan, said Queen Susan, if you will all have it so, let us go on and take the adventure that shall fall to us. So these kings and queens entered the thicket, and before they had gone a score of paces they all remembered that the thing they had seen was called a lamp post, and before they had gone twenty more, they noticed that they were making their way not through branches but through coats. And next moment they all came tumbling out of a wardrobe door into the empty room, and they were no longer kings and queens in their hunting array, but just Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy in their old clothes. It was the same day and the same hour of the day on which they had all gone into the wardrobe to hide. Mrs. McCready and the visitors were still talking in the passage, but luckily they never came into the empty room and so the children weren't caught. And that would have been the very end of the story if it hadn't been that they felt they really must explain to the professor why four of the coats out of his wardrobe were missing. And the professor, who was a very remarkable man, didn't tell them not to be silly or not to tell lies, but believed the whole story. No, he said, I don't think it will be any good trying to go back through the wardrobe door to get the coats. You won't get into Narnia again by that route. Nor would the coats be much use by now if you did. Eh. What's that? Yes, of course, you'll get back to Narnia again someday. Once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. But don't go trying to use the same route twice. Indeed, don't try to get there at all. It'll happen when you're not looking for it. And don't talk too much about it even among yourselves. And don't mention it to anyone else unless you find that they've had adventures of the same sort themselves. What's that? How will you know? So, you'll know, all right. Odd things, they say, even their looks, will let the secret out. Keep your eyes open. Bless me, what do they teach them at these schools? And that is the very end of the adventures of the wardrobe. But if the professor was right it was only the beginning of the adventures of Narnia. The End